declining now. And, uh, you know, I don't know what this line means to you, what this graph means to you, but it means more to me than just birds declining. Because as those birds decline, hunters decline. And as hunters decline, of course, we see less bird dogs that have a real good purpose. And that's sad for me. Uh, but also, uh, that means less money spent in those rural economies. And as there's less money spent in those rural economies, there's less people that interact with quail and care about quail, less landowners that have an incentive to uh, do quail management, and certainly less political and economic decisions made for quail. And to me, that's pretty drastic. Now, I've been hunting quail since I was 10 years old. I, that's when I flushed my first covey, and to be honest, it scared the shit out of me. Uh, and I hunted quail all the way through when I was in high school. This is a picture of me and my uh, buddy, Brian Radican hunting on our little place out in Bowie, Texas. And uh, he's using my shotgun and I have my dad's Snake Charmer 410. So I don't know if you've ever hunted quail with a Snake Charmer 410, but that's pretty damn exhilarating. <laughs> I graduated high school in 1990 and went out to serve on submarines. And uh, when I returned in 1996, and I'll bring your attention to 1996 right here, uh, they were saying, hey, there's not many quail left. And I was really shocked by that because there's no quail on the submarine. And I was getting ready to come back and have a good time. So let me just give you a visualization of what that looks like in 1996. Uh, this is the density or the relative abundance of quail across the United States per the breeding bird survey. Now imagine 1890. So back in 1890, uh, this would have been all that good Aggie maroon. Are there any Aggies in the house here? There we go. Don't, don't let me down. And so uh, that, uh, that, that whole eastern portion of the U.S. would have been that Aggie Maroon, high densities of quail throughout the east. Uh, but 100 years later, we just see it out in the Midwest. Now, fast forward seven years, you don't even see that Aggie Maroon color anymore. Uh, you just see this uh, lesser uh, relative abundance, this dark red, and that's only in the Midwest. Fast forward seven more years, that's just in the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma, a little bit in South Texas, and a little bit sporadic throughout the Midwest. And fast forward just a little uh, further, and you only see those high densities, which are about a third of what used to be good, uh, in the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma and South Texas. This is a pretty drastic change from 1996 and you can imagine if you went back to the 1890s uh, what this change would look like. It's a pretty drastic decline in quail populations. So the question is, is why, right? Uh, why is this happening despite our best efforts? Everybody in this room is doing a great job to ideally return this quail to its glory days, reverse that quail decline, but those quail continue to decline. Well, when I think about the driving factors that are driving that Texas quail decline, I, also, I often think of Dr. Fred Guthrie. So uh, he didn't cause the quail decline that I know of. But uh, when I was a grad student, this is a picture of me as a grad student at Texas A&M. My major professor was Dr. Dale Rollins, and his frenemy was uh, Fred Guthrie. And every time we had a quail symposium, I'd go seek out Fred Guthrie and ask him questions about the Texas quail decline and, of course, my project. And he would, I would say, what do you think about this factor or that factor? Or here's a new thing that came out in the news. And he would say, calm down, calm down. I think it's much more simple than that. So keep it simple, stupid was his kind of uh, uh, mantra to me. And so as I think about the Texas quail decline, you can really put it into two categories, or at least the majority of causes into two categories, climate and humans. Now, as we all study quail uh, and the obviously the Texas quail decline, um, you know that drought drives quail populations and we're seeing a higher drought frequency. You can look at these temperature changes in Texas from the 1890s all the way to 2022 and you can see the temperatures are getting hotter and that frequency of drought or that frequency of high temperatures is you know persistent uh, so far and our cooling periods are no longer cooling periods they're just less hot and so that really impacts quail populations. Populations. As you know, what that does is reduce that juvenile production or that chick production. And that's really important because uh, 50 to 80 percent of quail die each year. And so we're dependent on chick production. That chick production is key to rebound that population and have an increase. Drought, increased frequency of drought causes that not to happen. 
Now, also, this, this problem is exacerbated by agriculture. And when I think about that, I think about CRP. During drought years, well, I'll just say this, it's really a battle for grass in the spring, right? Uh, cattlemen want to get gain on their cattle during the springtime. That's when the grass grows. That's the best time to get to that forage. And also, that's the best time that we need that grass for quail. That's when we need nesting cover. So that battle for grass in the spring is pretty prevalent, and it's just really uh, exacerbated during in drought years. Think about CRP. They reduce the rules, they relax the rules during those drought years, those high heat waves, and say it's okay to, to graze that cover during that time when we need it the most, and quail continue to decline. Because of these drought, we have thermal habitat loss or thermal habitat fragmentation. We don't think about that very much, but what that looks like is good habitat. And then you go out there and you realize there's no quail because it's too hot for them to inhabit that area and quail continue to decline. And then of course we have climate change. And regardless of what you think on the topic, we often see these, these changes in natural cycles. So just think of this as, you know, uh, the hatching starts a little bit earlier so that as an adaptation, so those quail can get out of that hot temperature. Uh, but let's say insect production, that food for those chicks are not available at that time. So that disconnect between food and chick production is uh, often altered during those drought years and those quail continue to decline. Now, as we look at humans, we think, oh my gosh, is this guy saying it's my fault that these quail are declining? Well, not really, y'all are doing a great job. And in general, it's nobody's fault, but we are selling off our ranches. We're getting reduced parcel sizes, reduced ranch sizes. Dr. Hernandez talked about the crops uh, being fragmented quail habitat in the Northwest Texas, uh, but not so much down in South Texas. And that causes the quail to continue to decline. We also have that native grass conversion from native grasses to Bermuda grass across much of our area. And that's just like a biological desert for quail. So those quail continue to decline. And then of course we have overgrazing and clean farming. With overgrazing, I think about take half, leave half. It's not half of what you see, it's half of what's supposed to be the pristine condition. But often we take half of what we see or maybe a little bit more. And you got it by now, the quail continue to decline. And as those quail continue to decline, we have less focus, less social focus, less people that care, less economic and political decisions that are made for quail, and those quail continue to decline. And we're in that spiral, that population vortex that Dr. Hernandez talks about, and it's really uh, bothersome. Despite our best efforts, the quail continue to decline. So I had this student, uh, Lex Gomez, Alejandra Gomez, we call her Lex Gomez. She's now Dr. Gomez. She's a neuroscientist, very smart. And she said, hey, Dr. Reyna, I think everybody's just doing it wrong, right? Um, she went and read all the historic documents that we have for quail. Uh, when you come into the lab, you gotta read all these, Leopold, Stoddard, uh, all the legends, Reyna, Rollins, <laughs> uh, Hernandez. Um, and she said, hey, when I look at this, all the um, studies that we've done are on a really small scale. They're on a ranch level, right? And in fact, uh, the research, the management, and the conservation that come of this is really on a small scale too. And if I look deeper into that, these management practices aren't designed to reverse this big quail decline. What they're designed to do is increase the interaction of humans and quail during the hunting season, right? We want more cubby flushes per hour, more encounters for those humans. Humans. She said, so I don't know uh, why y'all would have this big question, why? Um, it was never designed to reverse this quail decline. We got to work on a much larger scale. And she was right. How do we work on a larger scale? Aren't we all working on a pretty big scale? We're doing a great job. Well, to learn about the future, what we should do in the future, we can often look in the past. And there was a, a bunch of, a group of hunters that came together in 1938, worried about the decline in ducks. So just like the, the great organizations we have with Park City's Quail, Quail Coalition, Quail Forever, uh, these hunters that became concerned and took action and put together a good group of people, that's what they did for ducks back in 1938. And as I read through this history of this uh, duck, you know, reversing the duck decline, basically, I kind of picked out five key areas that really made a difference. The first thing is they knew they had to act big. These ducks don't just, uh, they don't have the perception of working on one ranch or anything of that nature. You know, they have these big migrations. So they said, this is going to be a big problem. We'll have to work from uh, Canada to the U.S. down to Mexico. 
So we're going to need a lot of money. So they needed to secure sustainable funding. And that sustainable funding, they did a good job through those memberships. The second thing they did is they focused on a population level. They said, we can't just work with this rancher and that rancher and on these small scales. We have to conserve these flyways, byways, and wetlands from Canada, Mexico, uh, and uh, the U.S. So they worked on that population level and they did a good job. The third thing they did is they invested in landowners. They had to convince the landowners, think the panhandle, hey, don't fill in those prairie potholes so you can grow more grass for cattle. Uh, we have to give them an incentive so that they don't do that and they conserve those prairie potholes, ephemeral ponds and wetlands. And they did a good job on that. And the uh, fourth thing they did is prior to prioritize ducks and all political and economic decisions. And if you go to Washington, D.C. or Austin, uh, you'll often see that Ducks Unlimited sticker on the back of those pickup trucks of those senators and representatives. They've done a good job on that. And then the last thing they did is develop a plan for recovery and sustainability the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. And if you read that, it's really remarkable. Not only do they have the big plan for the duck population recovery, but they also have uh, a role for every rancher, every landowner that's involved to know how they can be involved in that recovery. And I think that's important. Uh, they've been successful. They've raised $3.5 billion since 1938, and they've uh, recovered 13 million acres. I think that's a pretty good job. So I think we can learn from them implement a similar plan and recover this quail decline. If ever you wondered if they're doing it right and we're kind of doing it wrong, you can look at this new science article that came out not very long ago that said we've lost three billion birds since 1970. That's during my lifetime. Uh, so uh, three billion birds since 1970, pretty big deal. The only one to increase is uh, waterfowl or the wetland birds and uh, grassland birds, including the bobwhite quail are, on the major, are one of the major losses uh, of those birds that have been lost since 1970. So we have just a small issue. If we're going to implement this plan, we have this one question that continually plagues us. What is a population level for, uh, for Bob White Quail? What's, how many acres do we need to conserve? What is the size of that population? So um, Guthrie's model, as uh, Dr. Hernandez said yesterday, uh, says that we need 800 birds on about 4,000 to 16,000 acres, if you think about it, uh, on a, a one to four acre uh, per Bob White uh, scale. So let's just say 4,000 acres. And uh, Williford's new genetic neighborhood says about 490,000 acres. So just a poll, raise your hand if you think 4,000 acres is enough. Or now raise your hand if you think 490,000 acres is probably more of where along the lines of population is. Yeah, so just a few hands come up here and there. Most people are like, I just really don't know. Well, even at the National Bob White Conservation Initiative meetings, the scientists are like, I don't, I don't know. We need to find out, right? So in 2014, we set out to find out at, at the Raina Laboratory. Uh, we were at the University of North Texas at that time. And so we were working in Clay County, Texas, which is 750,000 acres. And we did call counts uh, at 550 points, and we mapped those results to get kind of the first po uh, images of quail populations. So this is Clay County on the left and right, those images, 2014 on the left, 2015 on the right. And that is the results of uh, quail population call counts over that 750,000 acres. And just take a look at that. Do those, does those, do those quail populations reside on like 4,000 acres or closer to 500,000 acres? They take up closer to 500,000 acres of that 750,000 acres there uh, each of those years. And yesterday, uh, Fidel talked about taking a lens and looking at different scales. So if we take that lens and we put it anywhere across this map here of these quail populations, you can see here in this lens, the quail populations decline from 2014 to 2015 on a smaller scale if you're looking at like less than 10,000 acres. But of course, we know from 2014 to 2015, those populations really increased. So here's the picture of them increasing. And then we did this from 2014 to 2017. And it's the results are just like you experience it out in hunting, right? So 2014, uh, not the best year that started growing in 2015. That population really peaked out in 2016. And then they started kind of tightening back up in 2017. And we were able to capture that just through doing large scale um, 
large scale research for this large scale problem basically. And it's really a testament for the need for large scale research, although it is expensive of course, and it takes a lot of manpower and time. So we weren't sure. This is uh, the cross timbers uh, that we did before up in Clay County. And of course this takes over, you know, these quail populations reside over this 500 plus thousand acres, but is it the same in South Texas? So we went this year, we went down to South Texas, down to Starr County, and we did uh, 350, about uh, 350 uh, call counts across 700,000 acres. So this is almost the same size as Clay County. And you can still see that those populations reside in about, you know, 400 plus thousand acres there. So it is looking like Williford's genetic neighborhood is more, you know, conducive to what a quail population is. They reside over this 400, 500,000 plus acres across a landscape. And I think that's a testament for the need for large scale research uh, for this large scale problem. Now, because of this, now we know, we can look at history and know uh, what Ducks Unlimited did. They had a success story. Uh, we kind of know what a population level is for quail, for bobwhite quail. And so at Texas A&M Commerce, we started the Texas Quail Research and Restoration Plan. Now, the, research, the reason it says research and restoration plan is because most of the times people just kind of forget the research and they invest all the money in the restoration, right? I think we know enough. Let's move on. And so there's just a dire need for research money <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that is often overlooked. So if this was a big problem, like a medical problem like cancer, uh, you wouldn't think twice to raise a ton of money uh, for research, but uh, this is a huge problem that uh, we see continues to happen. And so we know funding is a big part of it. But anyway, research and funding is a big part of it. So the Texas Quail Research and Restoration Plan is very similar to uh, the plan that uh, Ducks Unlimited have, and it starts out with securing sustained funding for quail research. Now, you may think that this QR code goes to the plan, but it really goes to donate to quail research. So I uh, invite you all to do that. Um, our goal is to, to get $10 million over five years uh, for quail research so that we can implement these large scale, uh, this large scale research across the landscape in Texas and really get this problem turned around quickly. Now, I told this uh, plan to my friend Ted Lyon in uh, December, and uh, he said, man, this is really good. We really need to let a lot of people know I think this is going to work. And for those of you that don't know Ted and Donna Lyon, they're just remarkable people. They were high school sweethearts out of Terrell, Texas. Um, and through grit and determination, this is the story I like to tell here, that through grit and determination, they put Ted through college at Texas A&M University Commerce. Um, and then they uh, decided to uh, put him through law school at SMU. Ted became a senator, a representative and a senator for the state of Texas, where he met a very important person, uh, who is now our chancellor, John Sharp. And together they worked on sportsman issues across the state of, the state of Texas, considered to be saving the red fishery down in the Gulf, and also did a lot of work for wildlife across the state. Uh, Ted and Donna, of course, they go hunting and fishing all across the world. And uh, Ted became a, what I call a super lawyer uh, with a goal to help people out. And when you look to help people out, you can really make a lot of progress, and he did. And then Donna is what I call a super CEO. Man, she can run a shop and uh, she runs Ted's businesses and that line holdings and she does a great job. So when they heard about the plan and learned about our research more, uh, they decided to give the largest gift to Texas A&M Commerce and History and they gave a million dollars in, in December to start the Ted and Donna Lyons Center for Game Bird Research, which I'll tell you more about here shortly. Now this, go, this gift had cascading effects. So Ted and Donna Lyon gave a million dollars in December. Uh, by January, we received notice that we would get money from the state to, to build a facility for this center. And then Texas A&M Commerce said, look, we're all in on quail research, right? We're all in on this game bird deal. So we want to give a million dollars for your quail research in this building. Uh, shortly after that, Mike Hernandez from South Texas says, hey, I'm all in on this. Let's go 500,000. And then uh, after that, Bill McFadden, who I think is in the office. Bill, are you here? Are you here, Bill? There's Bill McFadden right there. Bill, thank you for your $1 million. Everybody give Bill a round of applause there. Thank you, Bill. 
Bill's an amazing man in and of itself. Uh, and he's with a bunch of people from the Bird Dog Hall of Fame here, I believe. And uh, the, the, the way they uh, train bird dogs out there is just quite amazing. You're going to want to talk bird dogs with Bill McFadden and his guests there. So we're now $3.5 million into our $10 million uh, uh, goal and uh, it looks like this may happen so man I'm so excited about this we're going to make progress on this Texas quail decline. So our second step in this Texas quail research and restoration initiative is to conduct large-scale research at a population level. So you've seen this happen in Clay County and also Star County and this year we'll be bringing on a research station in Archer County and also in Scurry County. So if you look at this map here you'll see the gold and brown and the gold and brown is where uh, quail species are predicted to be lost just on thermal habitat loss alone. So this is the Audubon Society saying hey in those areas we're going to lose one species, which is the yellow, or two species of quail, which is the dark brown, just on climate alone. Uh, in the blue area up in the Scurry County thing, that's where the blue quail is expected to expand its range. So as the climate warms up and changes, it's supposed to benefit the, the, blue, squail, the blue quail expansion in that area. So we want to capture that. And then over in Archer County, uh, similar to Clay County, uh, that is one of the last strongholds of quail in that area. You saw the maps where they're declining from that area so we really want to turn that around in that region. Not only do we map the quail there, but we also record climate across the landscape, the different resources. So think about habitat and different resources for these birds and also the human dimensions, the management style, the grazing regime, agricultural enterprises, decisions that landowners make to impact the land. And then our new thing is looking at stress. So uh, Sarah Courier out of our laboratory, she was a graduate student. She developed a technique to extract stress hormones from the quail scat. We're able to map those just like we map the um, the call counts, uh, so it would look something like this, and uh, we can see those stressful areas across the landscape, put focus on that for management and conservation, and hopefully relieve that stress point and grow those quail populations. The third step of the Texas Quail Research and Restoration Plan is to dis discover solutions for the profitable integration of quail and agriculture. This is really the linchpin, right? Um, because grazing is a big factor in Texas, and that's a big factor that's moving out quail, um, you have to find solutions, just like uh, not filling in prairie potholes or wetlands and for ducks, you have to do the same thing to have, to release that battle for grass in the spring uh, for quail and really have that good habitat all year long. Long. One testament to this is over in Clay County, so right across the street from Diaz-Murray, and Diaz-Murray has a similar situation there, where their grazing is so good that even in the drought of 2011, they had grass that would hit you in the back of the butt uh, across the landscape there. So, I mean, that is a solution that if their grazing regime is a solution, that if you could get that to go on across Texas, my gosh, we could make a big stride in reversing the quail decline pretty quickly. The fourth step is to prioritize quail in political and economic decisions. Uh, some people are pretty good about this, some are not. I was recently down in uh, at the House of Representatives giving them a talk and letting them know about this plan. And I got to tell you, everybody got goosebumps and was really excited with a sportsman caucus at the Texas House of Representatives. And they said, we want you back. Get everybody. So let's all go uh, back and talk to them about this quail restoration plan and get some good funding from the state so that we can make this plan happen. The fifth and final step of that Texas Quail Research and Restoration Plan is develop a statewide restoration and implement, implementation plan. We have to have a plan that works on a population level, that large scale, and that with, a, with an idea and a goal of reversing that quail decline, and it has a role for each landowner and each stakeholder to, have, uh, to know their role in reversing that quail decline. I think we can do it, I know we can do it, and together we can work to make this happen. So uh, now you know our Texas Quail Re Research and Restoration Plan. Uh, I want to quickly tell you about the Ted and Don Lyons Center for Game Bird Research. Um, our goal is to revolutionize game bird research. And uh, the thing that I'm thinking about there is we just want to make it better, improve techniques, uh, have a large scale focus. Uh, the second thing we do is discover solutions for sustainable game bird populations. When you're working on this large scale, you can really think about how are we going to have sustainable 
sustainability in this. So can we get the populations up and can we sustain it through time? That's our focus. And the third portion of that is to transform lives. Um, we have to invest in that next generation or else we're all at loss, right? Uh, there's a lot of old people here, including myself, uh, and there's a lot of young people here. So I'm. we brought a whole table of young people. I'm happy that they're and I see you young people throughout there. Please continue to carry the torch. We are dependent on you. I mentioned in January we got money for to build a facility for the Ted Nine Alliance Center for Game Bird Research. And just briefly, this will have an uh, uh, event center or education center where we can invest in that next generation. We can have meetings. We can have collaborations. You can all come out there when it's built in 2025 and uh, tour this facility. We can all put our heads together and reverse this quail decline. Uh, most of it will be a quail research lab and a quail production facility. You'll see those quail grow out pins there and then our quail behavioral training unit for our super quail project. It'll have a wetland research station. And one thing I'm really excited about is a quail encounter. So I don't know who's been up to Medicine Park, uh, Oklahoma, and you've gone to the aquarium because the day was too hot and you thought, oh, I got to not ruin this vacation here with my family. They don't want to be outside any longer. And uh, we've got to go up there uh, and get indoors somewhere. We went to the aquarium and they said, oh, you're the quail guy. Do you know that our quail are here? I said, I didn't know you had quail at the aquarium. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we went to the back of the aquarium and they have this big aviary and there's 200 quail in there at the Medicine Park Aquarium. And uh, you can go in there and feed them lettuce or greens or anything you want. And it was amazing to see the response of my children who obviously hear the word quail just like you did today too many times. And uh, they're just, were, their eyes were big, they couldn't stop. And I mean, for hours this went on. We can't get their attention for more than five minutes off this phone, but that quail encounter really grasped them for hours. And I think we can do that at A&M Commerce and create that experience for quail that people really need and will make a difference and in invest in that next generation. We talk about investing in that next generation uh, with our education center that will be part of that. Um, but also it comes with those gifts. So those that, that those dollars that are donated to our university, we ask that each person lay a, a portion of it for scholarships. So we have the Ted and Donna Lyons Scholarship, the Hernandez Game Bird Research Scholarship, and the Chuck Ryblin Scholarship for Chick, Chick Research. So when I call your name, please come to the front here. The first recipient of the Ted and Donna Lyons Scholarship is uh, Gabriela Rodriguez Sanchez. Gabby, thank you. Oh. The second recipient of the Ted and Donna Lyons Scholarship for Game Bird Research is Ms. Audrey Ivey. Audrey. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. The first recipient of the Hernandez Game Bird Research Scholarship is Ms. Loritza Tinajero. Loritza. And the first recipient of the Chuck Rablin Scholarship for Chick, Chick Research is Ms. Tina Regner. Congratulations, Tina. Investing in the next generation is so important, and I thank you all for that. I think we can reverse this quail decline. And with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been a part of our research, funded our research, helped us do this research. Uh, special thanks to my family who lets me chase quail for a living and, and uh, talk about it all the time. And finally, I'd like to give a thanks to Dale Rollins. Uh, you've impacted so many people, and you've certainly impacted me. So thank you for that, Dale. Thank you. That paper's mine.
Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Y'all track Kelly down if you have questions. Next up, we have Dr. Ryan Luna. I was going to set up his presentation. Okay. Yeah. Next up, we have Dr. Ryan Luna. Dr. Luna is the chair of the Natural Resources, the chair for the Department of Natural Resources for Sol Ross State University and the Kelly R. Thompson Professor of Quail Research at the Borderlands Research Institute in Alpine. He teaches curriculum associated with Range and Wildlife Management Program as a faculty advisor of the Range and Wildlife Club. Dr. Luna's interest focused primarily on the habitat use, foraging ecology, and upland game birds. Dr. Luna's research efforts have primarily been in the Trans-Pecos region, but he's also worked on projects in other regions and other states. In addition to his administrative research and teaching duties, he also serves on numerous regional and statewide conservation committees. Dr. Luna. All right. Sir, I'll let you know when you have five minutes left. Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. We've heard a lot of great talks about um, Bob White's and everything with quail, but I live in far west Texas. I know that Abilene's considered west Texas for some. Um, I'm about 300 miles further west. So uh, we're in Alpine, so just north of Big Bend National Park. And in our area, our quail, we have all four species. So Texas is very unique in that we have four species of quail. We have the Bob White that everybody's familiar with. Our main quail out in West Texas, our true West Texas area, is going to be scaled quail. And then we also have Gamble's quail along the Rio Grande um, and its tributaries, and then Montezuma's. Um, so my research primarily focuses on the three game species of quail that everybody else doesn't have in the rest of the state. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about Montezumas and some of the research that we've done uh, there in West Texas and then also portions of New Mexico and how that might play into habitat management for this species if you're in an area that has them. So how many people have been out in the Davis Mountains? Perfect. How many people have hunted Montezumas in New Mexico or Arizona? A few less. How many people would like to? <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, so Montezumas are a very unique species of quail. Um, they're very different from all of our other quail species. So they have this cryptic coloration. Uh, they don't behave like a normal quail species. Uh, whenever you walk up to a covey of Montezumas, their response is to crouch and hide. So they go motionless. Has anybody ever played hide and seek with a, a child and they think if they close their eyes, nobody can see them? I'm pretty sure that's what Montezumas do. So they walk up uh, flush right at your feet. If anybody has a heart condition, don't go Montezuma hunting because most of the time they flush right at your feet right before you step on them. Uh, we had a covey of Montezumas flush one time walked over with my grad student to assess the habitat where they had been. We've been standing there looking at the grasses and everything where they had flushed from for about three minutes, um, looking hard at the habitat, and we had one flush from between us. We had no clue that it was actually there, and it was three feet from us. So they blend in extremely well. Uh, they have that very cryptic um, defense mechanisms with the crouch and hide. Um, their range, we're at the very northern extent of their range in the United States. Most of the population of Montezumas is down in Mexico. We have a few areas areas in Texas that we have them, so Edwards Plateau and then out west in the Trans-Pecos with some of the best habitat being in the Davis Mountains. And then we have populations in New Mexico and Arizona with that um, southeastern corner of Arizona probably having the the greatest density of Montezumas in the United States. And most of the time they are associated with kind of a, a pine oak vegetation woodland uh, with some open uh, bunch grasses in the area as well. Uh, this is what they look like. Nobody's ever seen them. So our males are very brightly colored. You would think that they would stand out on the landscape, but they can completely disappear. Um, females are a little bit more uh, muted uh, with those browns and, and tans, and they blend in extremely well. Uh, how many people were watching all the different uh, little questionnaires and, and quiz bowl type questions yesterday scrolling through? So one of those was asking about which quail species had a longer toe. Um, this is what the Montezuma feet look like. So they forage differently from other quail. Um, they dig for subterranean tubers, and you can see that elongated toes and toenails. 
as part of their foraging ecology. Um, their loafing sites, we usually find them in areas that have lots of bunch grasses on um, those hillsides where they have the, the oak and um, pinon region. And they use those bunch grasses for thermal cover. Uh, there's been times that we've caught Montezuma's equipped them with uh, backpacks and released them and they walked about four feet from us and then just hunkered back down next to a bunch of grass so they didn't take off and fly like some of our other quail do whenever we release them. And all of those bunch grasses and that steeper habitat um, help for their camouflage and their, their loafing sites and, and what they utilize during the day. Um, like I said, they do dig for their, their forage, so they're also very difficult to catch and monitor. Uh, any other quail species, we can use a, a funnel trap, walk-in standard funnel trap, um, you know, catch hundreds or thousands over a couple months. Uh, Montezumas, it took us three years to catch 64 to put backpacks on them. So it's a much more intensive research. Um, and in order to do that, we usually use trained bird dogs. Uh, we go in, find where the birds are in the evening, um, come back after dark with spotlights, uh, bird dogs point them. We use a, a cast net or a dip net, put that over the top of the birds and the covey and catch them that way in order to um, be able to equip them with telemetry. Um, so it's a little bit different than, than being able to study some of our other birds. Uh, but by equipping them with telemetry, you can find out some of the, the smaller intricacies of what they utilize during the day and how they select some of that habitat. So you can really get some good ideas of some of those um, aspects like where they go for foraging. So we'll see if working all right so this is a male that is foraging and feeding across that landscape i can't remember if this video has all the others also but usually whenever you come up to an area that has montezuma that have been foraging uh, you'll see all these little pop marks uh, about the size of a silver dollar or smaller across the landscape just kind of spread out within about a 20 meter area uh, but this is their standard foraging behavior so you'll see them walking around kind of making these little digs and then a lot of times within those digs you'll find a husk of whatever tuber they were able to collect and um, feed on so kind of a unique style and their home ranges because of that are much smaller than what we see for a lot of our other quail and I'll go into those in a little bit more detail later on. How many people saw that female before it zoomed in on her? So even with that movement, sometimes it's a little bit harder to see these individuals, um, but they can crouch and just completely disappear. You can see with, with that cryptic coloration, if she stopped and moved uh, just like that, it just looks like another rock if we weren't moving the camera so fast. Um, but lots and lots of individuals across this area that are feeding. Uh, you see males pop up in the background and we could watch this video for a while and I wouldn't have to talk, but um, we'll go ahead and keep moving through. Um, so some of the objectives of our different studies over the last 10 years or so for Montezumas have been to analyze some of their habitat selection so we can know how to monitor the species and then also what we can do to bolster some of their populations. Uh, we also need to know what kind of roost sites and loafing cover uh, they utilize so they are similar to other quail and that they have that crepuscular activity which means just activities in the morning and then also in the evenings and then they uh, have that loafing cover that they utilize during the day. Um, one of the other things that we need to look at is the influence of feral pigs. So how many people are fans of feral pigs? How many people have an active feral pig control method? How many people have done illegal things with feral pigs? <laughs> I say that, it's like, what is illegal? Um, there's not much that you can do to a feral pig in Texas that's illegal, right? So we are the only state that you can trap them, uh, you can spotlight them, you can shoot them and leave them lay. How many people have gone for a hot air balloon ride? About three. Did you know in Texas you can take a hot air balloon ride and shoot feral pigs from the air if you want to? <laughs> How many people just added that to their bucket list? Yeah. All right, so all of those things said, you can uh, 
you know, because of the, the habitat destruction the feral pigs do, um, they are found in every county except for one. Uh, El Paso County claims to not have feral pigs. I know ranches that have feral pigs there. They just don't want to be associated with the last holdout of um, feral pigs. So they're found in every county in the state, um, in my opinion, not officially, but they're in every county in the state. Um, and they're also one of those uh, species that can be in, in influencing our Montezuma quail. And I'll talk about that here in just a couple minutes. And then we're also uh, gonna talk about a little bit of our current research and what we're doing to try to see what our current population densities are in the state. Um, so once again, for some of the basic habitat associations, uh, we were catching these birds. It took us about three years to be able to get a small sample size of 63 um, after we caught them and equipped them with uh, these little backpacks, kick them out on the landscape, record those movements, and see where they went. And all of this was in um, reference to a research project that we were going to be thinning juniper. So you guys know that juniper and mesquite are two, two of our species that have a lot of brush encroachment, um, like to fill in areas that used to be open rangelands. And within those hillsides and everything that Montezumas use, uh, juniper is one of those species that we need to look at uh, maintaining and, and kind of thinning out a little bit. So we had a, a hillside uh, about a little over 2,000 acres, about 2,200 and 32 acres um, that we were going to do a thinning project on. As we started to associate the canopy cover in this area, it was all at about 70 percent. Um, everybody in their lifetime seen an area that had been open and then got encroached with a lot of juniper or mesquite, depending on where you are. Um, so we targeted this area. Uh, before we started the thinning project, um, we started looking at the, the habitat use of some of these coveys. So you can see all the individual points there on your left of, from birds. And then all those polygons on the right are individual coveys. And then the, the black outline was the area that we were going to end up doing a thin. So we ended up thinning this area from about a 70, 75 percent canopy cover down to a 30 to 40 percent mosaic across most of it, um, with a little bit of areas pushing 60 percent. And then um, after the thin, this is what we saw. So we increased habitat use within that thinned area considerably by about 25%, um, but 85% of the total use of that region um, fell within that thinned area. So they are really targeting those areas that had had that canopy reduction. And when we started looking at the before and after, um, this is what we saw. So their home range size is quite a bit smaller than a lot of our other quail species in the state, only about 125 acres or so in the pre-thinning area. Um, that ranged from five acres to 254 acres. So there's times that these birds can be found and live throughout their lives in a very small area. Uh, some of the other aspects was that 50% core use area. So you can kind of think of this as that area where they're houses or where they work. That's where they spend about half of their time. And so within those areas, about 21 acres, is what they are utilizing within our post thinning area. So breaking that down to a 30 to 60% mosaic across that landscape had a little bit larger area that they were utilizing about 175 acres, but it did decrease their core size um, unit area down to about 13 acres. And when you started looking at what those core units were, all of them were within that thinned region. So they were spending the majority of their time in that area that had had that canopy reduction um, take place. And so if this other video works, uh, and this was one of our first birds and the movements that they had over about a month period of time. So you can just see for daily movements, bouncing around, moving quite a bit. Occasionally they would go out of that thinned area, but then pop back into it. Um, forage in some areas, utilize some areas for their loafing or uh, roosting habitat. But most of the time they were staying within those, those areas. So once again, we can see what they're doing and watch this video for a while. But just in the essence of time, I'll kind of summarize um, with this graph here. So uh, we did study these birds throughout the year um, over a couple of year, a uh, couple of about three years actually. And what it yielded was uh, information on how they change 
um, habitat use with the different seasons. So during the covey season, that area of fall and early or into the winter, um, typically during the, the hunting season, you can see that's our dark line there. They're primarily going to be in about that 30 to the low 40% uh, canopy cover. As they start breaking up into pairs and start looking for areas to breed, um, they're gonna change that canopy cover a little bit, start looking for a little bit denser canopy at about 50%. And then the same thing for our nesting and brooding, um, they're still using about that 50% range. So you can see how that changes throughout the year. Um, but most of all of the areas that they are selecting is somewhere between that 30 to 60% canopy cover. Uh, I have seen birds out in the middle of wide open space Spaces, so further down in that lower than 30%, but very rarely will you ever find a Montezuma in something that's above a 60% canopy cover. So if you have habitat that has good Montezuma area, um, you want to target that 30 to 60% mosaic could be perfect for them. Uh, we also did some studies with just the, the loafing aspects and what areas they are utilizing in the middle of the day. Uh, they are a species that utilizes bunch grasses considerably. And so this is your list of bunch grasses that they're targeting quite a bit. Uh, for Colin Shackelford's talk yesterday, one of the big ones that he showed pictures of was some of our gramas. I believe it was a blue grama, if I remember correctly, which coincides perfectly with what Montezuma's like. So some of those seed mixes would work well if you're doing some habitat restoration in areas that Montezuma's are. Um, but our regular blue grama side oats are going to be our top two for where they are using for their loafing sites. I'm going to speed up just a little bit here to get through the rest of this. Uh, so one of the other aspects with loafing cover is uh, the, the size of the trees. Um, so a lot of times you find Montezumas on hillsides like this. Uh, hiking through the Davis Mountains. This is what a lot of that region looks like. So you can see nice open trees, um, that about 30% area for canopy cover here, but um, nice bunch grasses throughout that whole area. So you wanna see bunch grasses that are taller than about 20 centimeters and trees typically in that one to three meter height. So they like to be able to flush and fly either between the trees or over the top of them. Montezumas don't fly as far typically as our scaled or our bob white. So it's going to usually whenever they flush, they set down in about 100 yards or less. So it's going to be kind of maneuvering through that landscape um, over the top of some of those smaller trees and then they set back down. And so in this area, um, having good habitat is always going to be imperative. And then uh, kind of controlling issues that may influence that habitat is going to be one of the other ones that you need to look at. So uh, how many people have been hiking in the Davis Mountains or down in the National Park and run into feral pigs? About three. How many people have been hiking and seeing feral pig damage? A few more. Okay, perfect. So um, even in West Texas in our very arid and climate, um, you can hike around and you can find damage like this. So remember Montezuma quail are digging for those subterranean tubers. And when a a group of feral pigs go through and they have this rooting behavior. You can see all that area that they just overturned is now no longer uh, suitable Montezuma habitat. So if Montezumas are trying to make a dig about the size of silver dollar and looking for tubers and that area becomes something like this, um, that's no longer an area that they can uh, forage very effectively in. So that greatly reduces the amount of forage availability for Montezumas, which is one of the things that I'd say we need to control our feral pigs. Um, how many feral pigs do we need to shoot or get rid of in order to maintain the current population? What percentage? Anybody know? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Good luck. So we need to shoot at about 70% to maintain our population. If we want to decrease our population, we need to harvest more than that. There's a lot of money put into feral pig management. Um, Feral pigs are fairly smart. They start getting pressured. They change their behaviors, um, go onto the neighbors for a little bit and then come back, uh, push them all onto the neighbors and they're their problem for a little while. But um, it is something that we do need to control, especially for some of our species like Montezumas, um, in addition to our regular cropland damage. 
Uh, so as you start looking at feral pig presence in the Davis Mountains, uh, with the Davis Mountains being some of our best habitat in the state for Montezumas, uh, you can see that they are uh, utilizing, so that darker red is going to be where we have a, a greater presence of feral pigs across that landscape. Um, if you look at our habitat suitability map for Montezumas across the Davis Mountains, the lighter areas are going to be those that have better habitat for Montezumas. Any correlation between those two? A little bit, and if you overlap feral pig with our Montezuma, you can see some of our best feral pigs habitat uh, utilization is also where our prime Montezuma habitat is. So this is going to be an issue that we're facing going into the future is just how much of that landscape are we losing um, due to feral pigs. So we don't have the densities out in West Texas like you guys do um, in Central Texas or South Texas with feral pigs, but they are an issue in some areas. So this is going to be something to continue to look at. And as we start moving forward, one of the big things is we can't manage population if we don't really know how many we have or where they are. So uh, this is your standard Montezuma quail map. Uh, you can see we just have a few isolated pockets of Montezumas here in Texas, mostly in the Trans-Pecos and then a couple spots in the Edwards Plateau um, and then New Mexico and Arizona, but the majority of the population is in Mexico. Uh, one of the things that we're working with currently is trying to come up with a true population estimator for Montezuma quail. And what we're doing right now is we're deploying these ARUs or using bioacoustics to record um, sounds because you know, half the time you walk by Montezuma quail, you can't go out and, and do your standard um, cubby calls very easily or your flush counts for Montezumas like you can for some of the other bird species. So uh, we are trying to these ARUs about the size of a game camera, but they just record uh, calls. And by analyzing those calls, which look like these, um, I don't have those ones programmed to be able to hear what they sound like, but um, that's what the recordings look like. And then as we scroll through those, uh, you can either listen to them or look at those specific hertz and be able to tell that that is a Montezuma present on that recording. Uh, we're using those in a grid pattern to find out kind of densities in those different areas. And then we're overloading um, those densities with our habitat suitability map to come up with a model that will roughly estimate um, our current Montezuma quail population in the state. Uh, it's something that has not been done before, but we're excited over the next year um, that we might have some preliminary estimates of how many Montezumas we actually have, at least in the Trans-Pecos. And then we'll see if we can uh, use some of those same um, recorders in the Edwards Plateau and see if they have the same densities there that we're seeing out west. So overall, if you have any friends or if you have landscape in West Texas um, or in the Edwards Plateau where we have Montezumas, uh, and the big things is just to keep that canopy cover between that 30 to 60 percent. That's going to have our ideal uh, canopy cover for Montezumas. You want to make sure that you maintain all your bunch grasses. Um, you don't want to overgraze that area or the Montezumas will leave. Uh, but a lot of that area where we find Montezumas, uh, you can also run cattle as long as you're keeping those bunch grasses intact. And then uh, your overall tree height in that one to three meters within that mosaic. So all of those are going to help out for having good habitat for them and providing those subterranean tubers and the, the water down to that soil that they need. Oh, and the other things is just an active feral pig management program. Um, reducing the number of feral pigs so they're not having that rooting behavior that's going to be destroying some of the, the habitat where they need to be able to forage or loaf during the day, or you will start losing your Montezuma population and they'll move elsewhere. And then we'll have, hopefully, if we have another one of these symposiums next year, uh, we can come back and tell you roughly how many Montezumas we have in the state and be able to start working toward um, some good management plans for those guys. Um, with that, of course, with any research, uh, it takes lots of different individuals to help fund. Park Cities has always been one of our, our huge supporters, along with other chapters of Quail Coalition. Uh, we teamed up with National Wild Turkey Federation and BLM in New Mexico, as well as Quail forever and some other projects um, over the last decade or so for Montezuma research and as well as you know we can't do anything without the support of landowners so we always want to thank our our landowners that are willing to open up gates and, and have us come on so I think I'm about out of time so thank you all for your time this morning if you have any questions on Montezuma grab me later I'll be happy to, to visit with you further or if you have questions on scaled or um, gambles quail um, in West Texas I'm happy to visit with you about those as well so thank you Thank you.
Thanks, Brian. Up next, we have Ryan O'Shaughnessy. Ryan currently serves as executive director of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. Ryan's career. What is Kristen? Oh my Ryan, goodness! Ryan just told me to change it. So Ryan just told you to change it. Christian Murphy yeah. is a third-year PhD student studying northern bobwhites at A&M Kingsville and the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. Kristen. And thank you, thank you. And I'm sitting down now, flash it will sign me up five minutes. Thank you. Ready to go. All right, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, what a pleasure it is to be in a room filled with so many people that care about quail um, and care about habitat and just care about the things that I care about and that make me happy. Um, I want to say a few things about Caesar Clayburg first. Um, I'm fortunate to be here to talk about my research, but I do want to talk about just Caesar Clayburg is putting out a lot of research. We put out quality research on quail throughout the year. Um, so it's not just my project that is important. So please always keep an eye out, sign up for the Caesar Clayburg newsletter. Um, but with that, if you haven't heard the words habitat loss and fragmentation enough over the last 24 hours, get ready to hear them about, I don't know, 10 or 20 more times, because that is what we're gonna be talking about today. So I want to get down to basics. What does the word loss mean? And so whenever we think of the word loss, it's something destruction, ruin, it's some decrease in the amount of something. And so when we put that into a habitat perspective, if you are clear cutting a forest, you take out all the trees, you are eliminating habitat that is habitat loss. You fill up a wetland, that's habitat loss. You mow a pasture because maybe the landowner, that's full of weeds, it's not something pretty to look at, so we're mowing all of it, that's habitat loss. And habitat loss and fragmentation kind of go hand in hand. And whenever you think of one, you typically think of the other. So fragmentation is something is a fragment, which is a part that is broken off. It's detached or incomplete, something that falls to pieces. And when we think of a contiguous landscape with a road running through the middle of it, um, we start to have habitat fragmentation and then say that that road gives access to that area. Well, maybe people want to build houses or maybe that's some fertile soil for agriculture. So fragmentation can look a little bit different across the landscape. Many things promote fragmentation. Um, so it can just, it can look and take quite a few different um, ways across what we see on the landscape. But so species in my opinion, um, how I've noticed species being able to, in a way, adapt and not in any ideal way per se. But coyotes, we know that can persist in these more fragmented landscapes. Possums, raccoons are some other examples of those um, species that have been able to, in a way, adapt to more fragmented or changing landscapes. We sometimes have a, an urban deer problem in some places. And again, those species that can seemingly adapt to that, but we have then air, um, other species such as mountain lion or other grassland bird species that are really, really impacted by any kind of fragmentation. But what we don't know and what we've obviously talked about quite a bit over the last 24 hours is where do bob whites fall along this gradient? Um, we haven't really put any solid numbers to where we know that they can persist and what kind of threshold that is. And so what we do know about bob whites is that they have experienced range-wide population declines. Um, this decline varies. And here in Texas, we have two seeming strongholds here up in North Texas in the Rolling Plains and then down south in South Texas. But we know that habitat loss and fragmentation have been suggested as this possible reason for the variability in the decline. However, we've never actually quantified this. And this is something that Dr. Hernandez actually put up yesterday. So this is that cropscape image where you can see the different kinds of agricultural crops. And if we hone in really on South Texas and North Texas, you can see that there's just a lot more color in North Texas, meaning that 
that there might be quite a bit more agricultural fragmentation. This isn't even including like urbanization. Um, whereas in South Texas, we might have a larger, more contiguous area of habitat and our cropland or agricultural activities are kind of on the fringes. So that leads me to my research objectives. So what we wanted to do with my project is to understand how habitat connectivity influences bobwhite populations in North and South Texas. We wanted to compare um, those landscape characteristics and habitat connectivity. And then we wanted to look at the relationship between habitat connectivity and bobwhite abundance. We hypothesized that in South Texas, we would see a higher amount of habitat connectivity than in North Texas. And we also hypothesized that across the board, that quail abundance would be increasing with increasing amounts of habitat connectivity, which is, is pretty um, typical. So specifically, my study areas were focused on the rolling plains and cross timbers and prairies up here in North Texas. And then South Texas and the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes in uh, the South Texas. And I wish I could be like Dr. Luna and have a really fun video of Montezuma's foraging on the landscape for my project. Unfortunately, that is not the case. When you look at habitat fragmentation and connectivity on a landscape scale, you're doing a lot of stuff on a computer. Uh, and it's not necessarily the most ideal when it comes to field work. So we're going to talk about some things that are going to get a little bit heavy. I hope I don't rush through them. And again, please come and ask me questions if you have them afterwards, um, because this is a lot of stuff that's going to be uh, very much computer based. But the first thing that we have to do when we're assessing bobwhite connectivity is we have to understand where is bobwhite habitat and where is it not. So we use the National Land Cover Database and Cropscape Land Cover Data. And I know Will Newman was actually talking about this in his presentation yesterday, where he talked about the pixel size of the landscape being 30 by 30 meters for aerial photography, um, for satellite imagery. Um, that resolution size can vary, but that's the size that I am working at. And so each individual pixel gets some kind of classification, whether that's urban, or grassland um, or bare ground, it has some kind of a land cover class. And so when I say land cover classes and that I have 15 of them, that is what I mean. And so I took those 15 land cover classes and I actually reclassified them into bomb white habitat and not habitat. We focused our, um, our research area around the Texas Parks and Wildlife Quail Survey routes. And we buffered these focal landscapes to be about 25 kilometer radius around those routes. And so what I want you to see in that top image where it's a little bit more colorful, there's green, tan, brown, that's the base NLCD imagery. So those are the original land cover classes. And in that bottom image is an example of where I converted it to Bob White habitat and not habitat. So the habitat is in lime green color, if that's the same on the screen. And then the not habitat is in blue and the, the black route is that TPWD route. We also removed pixels that fell within city limits that were bobwhite habitat because we didn't want any of our analysis to be taking place like within a city limit. And so the method that we used to calculate connectivity was a thing called a least cost path analysis. And it, it, basically the description is in the name. We're wanting to understand the cost of movement for a bobwhite quail to get from one habitat patch to the next. And to take into account these different impacts of different land cover types, if it's an ag field, if it's, you know, uh, shrub scrub land. So what we know is Bob White habitat. Some of those uh, land covers provide different costs of movement and so do different road types. A like Caliche road has a different cost of movement than a four lane highway would. So we wanted to take into consideration both the type of land cover and the type of road. And we assigned each of those different things a cost value. And so we assigned a one, for example, as the least cost of movement and a 10 as the highest cost of movement. Values ranged in between one and 10, but just as an example. And these are some examples to really help you understand maybe what this cost raster looks like. We have safer land cover, we have a forest area, and that got a cost of seven. We have a shrub scrub area that got a cost of one, and an urban area which gets a cost of 10. And the same thing goes for road types. So a highway would get a cost of 10, a county road would get a cost of about three, and an unpaved road or maybe caliche would get a one. So these are just examples 
examples for you to understand really how this analysis took place. But we basically put those values on top of each other and had to weight them a little bit differently. We gave a little bit more weight to the different kinds of roads than we did land cover because we know that whenever a quail 160 gram bird that's six inches tall that primarily walks on the ground encounters a highway or some other major road, it's going to inhibit movement a bit more than if they were to encounter some kind of a different land cover class. So putting both the habitat map and that cost raster together, um, oh, I do want to point out the cost raster in the top corner, the areas of black are the least cost movement and the areas of white are actually the highest cost. So that's what that looks like. And for the least cost path analysis, this all took place in a program called ARC Pro. Um, so I split the habitat patches into being these singular patches of habitat. So this might be a little bit difficult to see, but this being one of our focal landscapes, that blue area is one contiguous patch of habitat. And that means that those pixels that we classified as habitat all touch each other. You can see that there are these multicolored patches within there, and those are actually separate patches of habitat. So those are also other patches, but they're just separated by distance. We then used that cost raster and with a tool that's in ARC Pro called the Optimal Region Connections tool, we were able to generate these least cost paths given the cost of movement across the landscape. And those are those yellow lines that you see. So basically we took those yellow lines and then we calculated the distance of them. So how far was that path between patches? And we took that distance and patch size and we put that into a program called Program Conifer. And I promise this is our last step. But we looked at connectivity, which is the index of connectivity, which ranged on a, a scale of zero to one, zero being completely disconnected, one being completely connected. And then we looked at something called the equivalent connected area, which is in acres or hectares. And the equivalent connected area is just a metric to help you visualize what that index of connectivity actually means. Because sometimes it's hard to go to a property and say, oh, well, my connectivity out here is 0.4. But what does 0.4 mean, right? So we have to put something behind that. And that's what that equivalent connected area metric actually helps us do. We did exclude any of those least cost paths that were greater than 3,000 meters in length. And I did a pretty lengthy um, literature review on dispersal distances and minimum movements and things. But whenever we're looking specifically at Bob White dispersal, we, we found a paper and we went with it. And out of everything, this is kind of where we wanted to cut off how far we think quail move on average. So we chose 3,000 meters and nothing more than that. And so these two landscapes on the, um, on the side here, I did want to just give some examples of how this would look. Um, so we have patches of Bob White habitat, say up in this top square, and both of these squares are 100 acres, for example. That top square has quite a bit of habitat. There's quite a few lines connecting those. Um, it, looks, it looks pretty connected. And so visually, uh, we can just see that it, it does look better connected than the bottom one. This top landscape might get an index of connectivity value of a 0.7. And that might be similar to saying, okay, there's 85 connected hectares out here out of 100. Whereas in the bottom one, that landscape looks like it's actually completely cut off from one of the patches of habitat for, uh, by a roadway for example. So that bottom uh, landscape might get a value of 0.2. And so there might be equivalent to about 35 acres connected in that space. So hopefully this makes sense because this is how we're going to interpret the results here in just a second. But we just looked at general habitat characteristics. Um, we are going to look at those um, index of connectivity and the equivalent connected area values. And then we also conducted the simple linear regression when we looked at connectivity with quail abundance. And something to note here is that we did find some statistical um, things with our data, so some uh, non-normal distributions and things like that. But for the purposes here, I just want to 
put what we have um, and put a little note that we are going to be doing some further statistical work on this. So by the time we get it published, it'll be a little bit different. It might be quite a bit more refined. But for North Texas, we had a number of 71 routes. Um, so we had 71 of those circular buffered landscapes in North Texas, and we had a total of 36 in South Texas. Overall, we had a mean percent of bobwhite habitat of 72% in North Texas on average across all all of those landscapes, about a 72% habitat, whereas in South Texas, we had 80%. And then I did want to put the median values, but just for stats purposes. And then I did also want to note the average number of components. And so the way that Conifer looks at the landscape, whenever it is telling me, okay, this is what your connectivity is, it looks at it as a network. And so whenever you think of a network, you think of a node that's connected to another node by some link or path. And that's how Conifer actually takes that into consideration. But you can have multiple um, links with nodes that are not connected to other links and nodes. And I know that that's getting a little technical, but this is just an, another way to understand really how fragmented the landscape is. So we had about 33 components on average in North Texas, and we had about 19 in South Texas. So looking at the results for the index of connectivity, on average, we did find that our IIC value was 0.64 in South Texas, and it was only 0.5 in North Texas. Um, pretty more, it was a bit more similar than we were actually expecting to find, but it, we are going to refine the analysis, make sure and get some actual hard statistical significance tests behind this. Um, and then looking at the average um, amount of ECA or those equivalent connected areas. Um, we had about 360 connected acres on average in South Texas, whereas in North Texas, we had about 333,000. <laughs> So when we look at just the overall uh, relationships between the average quail abundance and the amount of connectivity that we have, we're seeing across the board, both North and South Texas, we're seeing a positive trend. So when you have more connected acres, your quail abundance is going to be higher. So that's all I want to note here, but the, that the trends really did check out. And so we're going to also refine this analysis a little bit more as well. And so for a summary, because I know that that was a lot from the methods to the results, um, overall we saw a little bit less habitat in North Texas than we did in South Texas. We did find a little bit lower connectivity in North Texas than South Texas. But across the board, we're seeing that positive relationship between habitat connectivity amount and bobwhite abundance. And our preliminary findings suggest that habitat connectivity differs between these two regions and that quail abundance may be influenced by the amount of connectivity across the landscape. And so this study does provide a means for prioritizing um, areas for conservation because from my results, I can actually pinpoint areas on the landscape that are more fragmented or less fragmented in both North and South Texas. And so it also provides initial evidence that habitat loss and fragmentation may be these ultimate factors that are impacting the quail decline. But so the project doesn't end here. This is a PhD and this seems more like a master's. Um, so I've got three more components of what we're actually gonna do. My project in its entirety is actually trying to view the, um, the Bob White, is trying to view Bob White management as a social ecological system. And so we're not only looking at quail habitat, we're also going to be looking at quail population dynamics. And we're also going to be um, sending out a survey to gather stakeholder perceptions on the quail decline, where your information is coming from, what are some of your management techniques, where do you think research is lacking in your area? And so, I mean, if I was to ask this question of who in here is a stakeholder of quail, I would hope that everybody would raise their hand because everybody here cares in some capacity about quail and quail management. And so I will be sending out that survey in the spring of 2024. I am gonna be putting a QR code up here in just a second. There's also a QR code on a table outside. If you wanna take a minute and scan that, you will be put on a waiting list um, to take my survey. So it will ask you for your first and last name, your email and your phone number, and you will get that uh, via email. It's gonna be completely online 
online. I'm hoping that it won't take more than 15 to 20 minutes to fill out, but it is going to be an in-depth survey, and we're trying to gather as much information as possible from it. Um, so the analysis in its entirety will be analyzed with kind of a different statistical um, test. So we're going to take it a, a totally different Bayesian route. Um, don't ask me what that means at this point. We've This is in the preliminary stages of that as well. So I am not a Bayesian analysis person at all, but one of these days I, I hope to be. Um, with that, I want to thank Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, um, specifically John McLaughlin, who was really integral in getting this project up and off the ground. Uh, he really believed in it at the beginning um, and supported it and still supports it to this day. Um, but then also the Greater Houston Chapter of the Quail Coalition for providing funding. I'd like to thank the Cesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute for just supporting me as a student and supporting this research, my quail lab mates and friends. And then I think I might have some family Family that is joining on live stream. So shout out dad, happy birthday. Um, and here is that QR code. So if you would take a minute and you can, if it works and you can scan it here, it'll take you automatically to the link. And if for some reason you have problems, please come let me know. Um, but if not, you can also find this outside. So Thank you so much for your time today. I It's just a pleasure to be here. Um, I was here in 2019 and I got to talk about Montezumas and now I'm here again and I get to talk about Bob White's and it's, it's just a pleasure and an honor to be honest. So thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Ryan O'Shaughnessy. Ryan ser currently serves as the Executive Director of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. Ryan's career spans studies on sable, some animal I can't pronounce, puku, antelope in South Africa, waterfowl, pronghorn, all the quail across the United States. Eight years as a professor at Sol Ross and the founder and owner of West Texas Quail Outfitters and Alpine, where he currently resides with his wife and three daughters. Undoubtedly, his greatest accomplishment to date is currently feeding and maintaining a kennel of 27 English pointers. And yeah, that's quite a bit of work. So, Ryan. <laughs> While we're um, waiting on this, um, I don't know if anybody else in the audience picked up on this, but I think uh, Dr. Luna wowed us with all those cute Montezuma videos. Did you notice how he showed us exactly where the research was done in Texas, where we can't hunt Montezuma? And he was very vague about New Mexico. <laughs> Don't be selfish, Ryan. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for um, sticking around um, this morning. Um, we've had a lot of great presentations telling us about what we do know about quail. Unfortunately, my presentation is going to tell you what we don't know. Um, we are in the, we're, we're pretty far along in the, the process of um, designing and funding a study to look at the effectiveness of a medicated feed in wild populations of quail. Joe Crafton touched a little bit on this um, yesterday during his presentation, so I'm going to give you guys just a little bit more of a background. But before I do this, um, I, I must say over my career, I've been fortunate enough to work with a host of, of really, really good researchers. I think this project undoubtedly is the one that has incorporated probably the widest array of experts um, on any project that I've worked on. If you look at the affiliations down below, we've got people from Texas to Georgia to Scotland and I think even Norway on this. So we're really um, trying to assemble an all-star team to conduct this study because we, we, we think it is that important. 
So again, Joe touched on this um, briefly yesterday. Uh, it's no secret. We all know that these quail exhibit boom and bust cycles through throughout the years. Um, one of the things we noticed, I'm sure most of y'all will remember, back in 2010, we had fantastic, fantastic bird numbers. Habitat was good, rain was good, it had been for a couple of years. The very following year, boom, population crash. More recently, you guys remember 2015, 2016, again, really, really fantastic bird numbers. You couldn't throw a rock at a bush without flushing a cover your quail out of it. And almost immediately the following year, boom, population crash. The 2015 one was maybe less important in, in the, in the um, initiation of this project, but right after 2010, a really key group of, of organizations and people, um, the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation, Park City's Quail, and Ron Kendall at uh, the Texas Tech Wildlife Toxicology Lab, got to thinking about this, well, heck, if all of our habitat and everything is good, why are we still having these massive drop-offs in our quail when it seems like everything else is, is really fantastic? You could see all these study sites. Again, Joe um, showed some um, or, or spoke about this. We've, we've seen a couple of other presentations that, that showed this map. There was a large-scale quail collection effort, a whole bunch of necropsies done. Um, and, and that was part of the Operation Idiopathic Decline uh, initiative. Um, I think a lot of people today, when they hear OID, they assume that the, the, the impetus was to go out and specifically look for parasites. I want to tell you guys that it was much, much bigger than that. I mean, we were out there looking at everything from bacteria to parasites and everything in between. The one key factor that really stood out, however, were the parasites, were the sequel parasites and the eye worms. So that got everybody thinking, well, okay, what does that mean? Um, everybody in this room knows you can go out and you can shoot a Tweety bird, you can shoot a deer in the wild. Chances are they're going to have parasites. So when we started looking at these parasite loads in these quail, the question really became, well, okay, is this just something that they are able to live with and really be okay? Or is it something that's truly detrimental to the population and lowers survival? Joe mentioned again red grouse. We had fortunately, it gave us some, some direction to go. But this, these graphs are from Peter Hudson's work in Scotland. He started looking at red grouse. And you can see if you look along the axes there, I can't read that screen, but the top graph is your population growth rate. And the bottom graph is your breeding mortality. So that's the number of chicks dying. And your bottom axis there is the number of, um, this is uh, gastrointestinal worms in, in the individual. And you can see there's a really, really strong pattern there. More parasites in the individual individual, the lower the population growth, and the higher the juvenile mortality. So this really does give us some sense parasites are bad. They took this one step further, and if you look at these three graphs, that uh, first graph on the top left there was the control population of red grouse. And you can see just like our quail, there's these really strong cycles. Population highs, very short interval, population lows. Population high, population low. What they did, I'm not sure if they used fenbendazole in this study. I don't think it was. I think they used some other um, anti-helminth um, treatment. But you could see on that bottom left graph, after one treatment, it was quite a substantial drop in the, um, um, in, in the, in the peaks, right? Eliminated one of those peaks or one of those troughs, sorry, back to front. After two treatments, look at what they were able to do to that population in, in red grouse. They were really, really able to stabilize that and, and get those grouse out of that cyclic nature. 
I do want to point out that the population metrics on the x-axis there, there, they were using an estimate of population from um, hunter harvested grouse. Anybody been to the UK? Anybody been fortunate enough to go on a driven shoot? They are mostly pen raised birds. So what I want to point out with this as a caveat, and it'll become important a little bit later, because of the way they raise these birds, these red grouse for these shoots, um, and just the, the, the structure of, of the habitat um, that they have these birds on, they were able to, to really control the medication rate that they were giving to these birds very, very effectively. And you'll see in a couple of slides why, this, why that's important. But what does this all mean for Bob White? Um, Currently, we've got some good theories. There's been some anecdotal work done, but we don't really know. Um, Wyckoff here, this is a study that's in press right now from Oklahoma. Um, those colored bars are indications of uh, body, body fat scores. Unlike with us, the fatter the bird, the healthier the bird. I wish it was the same way with us, but it's not. But you can really see that as the number of parasites in the individual increase, the probability of that bird having a good body fat score decreases appreciably. So it was this relationship here that was really the, the motivation behind the development of quail guard. Joe spoke about that. It's only the second medicated feed for wild populations of animals in the US to get FDA approval. Um, a month or so back, um, I, I had the pleasure of being able to go and, and tour the wildlife toxicology lab with Ron Kendall. You guys have heard about this FDA approval. I don't think anybody truly appreciates the amount of work and effort it takes to get an FDA approval. I think Joe was telling me and Raymond was saying originally they thought this might take a year or two to do. I think it ended up being six years and probably three times the, the cost. The amount of paperwork that you need to submit is phenomenal. The amount of people that you have to get involved to develop something like that is unbelievable. I think Ron told me last count they had no fewer than 80 or 84 professional scientists, veterinarians, state agent, agency personnel involved um, with getting that FDA approval. So I really do commend everybody that was involved with that. So that leads us to the point of, of our research that we're looking to, to develop and move forward. The two big questions that are still outstanding when we're looking at this medicated feed for wild populations is first and foremost, what is, what is the impact of eyeworms and sequel worms on Bob White survival and reproduction? Like I said, we know these are wild populations. Everything's got parasites out in the wild. We are making an assumption that, hey, these parasites are bad. They are having an impact on survival. We need to test that and conclusively prove that. Secondly, if we are developing this medicated feed, just like um, they, they did in Scotland, and we want to put that out on the landscape, will this reduce parasite burdens that will actually result in a measurable change in survival? It's all well and good going through through all the effort and everything to do this, but if we're not able to administer that feed in an effective manner to get enough medication into the birds, it's not really going to accomplish much. Before I get into talking about this, um, I, I do want to put everybody's mind at, at ease in this. Um, you've seen from the logos, you've seen from the connections that we've been talking about. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I've, I've had certain interactions with, with members of the audience that have said, well, you know, if, if Rolling Plains, Quail Research Foundation and Park Cities and, and Texas Tech have the patent behind this and, and are looking to make revenue from this, can you be unbiased in the research? 
this was a question that was raised really early on when we were putting our team together. We started talking about, well, okay, if we've got all this financial investment and financial incentive, what if we put all this feed out there and it doesn't do a damn thing? Are we going to be able to, to publish that research? Will, will the rest of the, the stakeholders in this be, be okay with us publishing this research? So I called Joe Crafton and had a chat with, with, with Joe and everybody else that was involved. And Joe told me uncategorically, Ryan, this research will get published no matter what we find. So for anybody who's thinking that there may be a little bit of a, uh, a research bias or question bias in there, please put that to, to, to ease. This is going to be as transparent as, as it possibly can be. All right. So getting to the research design, obviously we want to see if this is going to work over a landscape. We really want this to make a difference at a population level. Because of that, again, fortunately or unfortunately, we need a lot of land to be able to do this. We need a lot of feed to be able to do this. We need a lot of transmitters to be able to do this. So our current design is set up where we're looking to partner with three big ranches. Um, these ranches are going to need to be in the region of about 14,000 acres minimum to set up three independent assessments with five treatments, as you can see that I've laid out there. We want to administer this feed according to the feed recommendations um, and through the feeders that they've um, done some anecdotal testing and small scale testing for the FDA approval. We want to use everything as, as is stipulated on that label that comes on the feed bag. So that accounts to one feeder per 200 acres. Uh, Ronnie Kendall Jr. in the back there, I think, Ronnie, you're about to get real busy. That, I would say you should probably go start building feeders because we're going to need a lot of them. Um, we're going to administer spring and fall treatments. And you guys can do the math with me between those five treatments on those three ranches. Our target right now is to put transmitters on 50 birds per treatment per ranch per year. So we're going to be putting out 750 transmitters a year. I'm getting some looks in the audience like, well, might want to wait for it to rain because do we have ranches right now that have 250 birds that we can put transmitters on? We think we do, but that, that remains to be to be seen. We've had a few um, questions on this first part of the study. Um, so gavage, for, for those of you that don't know what that means, literally you catch the bird in, in, in a trap and we're going to take the medicine in a syringe and squirt it right down their throats. This is a critical step because we know from the FDA testing that Dr. Kendall has done that the medicine works. We, we've shown that that works. But we do need a sample population out in the environment that gets the medicine and the appropriate dose on the landscape for us to compare our other treatments to. It's no good us foregoing that step and, and trying to compare the effects to a lab setting, we, we, we need to actually test this out in the wild. So that's why we're going to be administering one treatment group with the Gavage treatment. We know they've got the exact right amount and we can compare it. The important thing about this step is at this point, we really don't know how effectively those birds will be coming into the feeders and eating the medicated feed. Will they be eating enough of the medicated feed? We had a presentation yesterday um, and the talks on the, the ranch tours. We know how variable the, the, the environment is. If we get really good rainfall out on the landscape and we've got natural food everywhere, we might not be able to get these birds to come in to eat enough um, supplemental feed. So this is a very, very crucial step. And what we're looking to identify again in that step, 
These graphs um, on the y-axis on the bottom, note there is a difference in the scale. We are making the assumption that the medicated feed, at least initially, the first treatment, isn't going to knock those parasite burdens to absolute zero like we can, we can assume with the gavage. So you can see on the bottom there, um, on the gavage, on the, on the, the, the left graph, we're making the, the assumption that if all these birds are medicated correctly, and this is built off of Dr. Kendall's research, that we're, we're going to be able to, to almost completely eliminate those parasite loads in, in the quail. In the medicated feeder, we're, we're making a tentative assumption that the first year or two, we're not going to be able to remove them completely, but we're certainly going to be able to knock those parasite loads down a heck of a lot. Again, we have seen a lot of anecdotal evidence that supports this assumption. Joe had mentioned on the Snipes Ranch, they saw a tremendous decrease in the number of birds with parasites. Um, it was in a two or three year period, Joe. So we're trying to build on that, on, on that anecdotal evidence to make our assumptions here. Any good research project has a control, no real need to, to delve into this. We're going to have birds that we don't do anything to, to, to compare uh, the feed to. All right, so the medicated feed, I'd shown it on a, on a previous slide. Um, as per the recommendations of, of the developers, we're going to be using the quail safe feeders um, and we're going to be putting that medicated feed in these feeders at a distribution rate of one feeder per 200 acres on the landscape. The feeders take, memory serves, 150 pounds, Ronnie, 150 pounds of, of medicated feed and we're going to be applying that um, application in the fall and in the, and in the spring. One feeder per 200 acres, ladies and gentlemen, you, you can tell we're going to need a heck of a lot of feeders to ensure independence between our treatments. We're going to try to keep at least a two mile buffer between each of these treatments on each ranch. So that's why you can see, you know, we'd love to be able to come out and work on everybody's ranch for this. but for the scientific integrity of this and to ensure independence of treatments, we are unfortunately going to be constrained by ranch size um, for this study. So when we're looking at our timeline, um, we're obviously in 2023 right there. We've got the proposal. We've already started to, to secure funding, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But we're really hoping to hit the ground running early next year. This obviously is all contingent on the FDA and how quickly they are going to be able to give us that label where we can start getting the feed out in, into production. So I would say this right now is a tentative timeline. We've got uh, 2024, five and six built in to conduct the research on this. And then in 2027, synthesize all the data um, and put it into a, a, a palatable form to disseminate, not just to the scientific community, but to the hunting and landowner community too. So watch the space. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, at the next symposium in uh, two years I can give you an update I'm really hoping that it'll be a positive update and then in another two years I'm hoping that I can tell you guys wow look at these graphs we don't have that crazy fluctuation that's the optimist in me speaking because of the um, complicated nature of this and all the stakeholders and everything involved, we, we are paying, uh, I can tell you this absolutely definitively, that this is the one research project that I've been part of that has focused on scientific rigor far more than any other. Um, like I say, we've, we've got a very strong experimental design. Um, we're able to do that by bringing in a whole bunch of extra um, a, a team members to be part of this and sharing expertise. Um, 
oh, what, a very important um, point on this. When we do set up the treatments, we are going to use a blind study design. We don't want any of our researchers going out on the field into a pasture, say, that has the medicated feed and allowing that to bias their data collection. We're all the same. I know when I put quail blocks out at my house, I feel like I see a hell of a lot more quail than my neighbor. I don't know if I really am. I'm not collecting that data, but we're trying to eliminate that. We're trying to eliminate this inherent bias that we may have in our observers. Um, we may, we're may we probably going to use some sort of a mixed model um, analyses when we do this too, so we can control for what observer was on what property on a particular day. We're also going to follow open science principles. Um, what I'm talking about in open science, is this is a wonderful platform that's, that's relatively new. Um, so for all the researchers out there, you can submit your study design to an open science platform and essentially your, your, your manuscript gets pre-vetted. Your study design gets pre-vetted by the scientific community. So it, it really, really helps you ensure you've got a very strong study design and it should theoretically make it a lot easier to get published at the end because hopefully we've received all the criticism on the, on the front end. The budget. Oh boy, this one's going to be a big one both literally and figuratively. Um, we are very, very fortunate to have good partners. Um, Park City's Quail Coalition has already committed $450,000 to this project. Um, we've had a verbal commitment from Texas Parks and Wildlife for another $250,000. I'm trying to look for John McLaughlin in the audience. There we go, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so we are getting there. Uh, if you were to go through this budget, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think for, for the three or four year study, we're looking at a, at a price tag of about $2.8 million on this. It's obviously very front heavy. You guys saw the number of feeders that we're going to have to get, the number of transmitters. We obviously need vehicles, um, et cetera. One of the other really cool things we want to implement in this, because we are using um, feeders on the landscape to get the feed out there, we're planning on putting these RFID tags on some of the quail so we can tell exactly how often these birds are coming in and out of that feeder. And that should really allow us to, to refine the effectiveness of getting that medicated feed into the birds. Again, unfortunately, those RFIDs aren't cheap. Um, so if anybody, I'm going to start calling out names here. Um, Bill, Fidel, Luna, if you guys just happen to have a whole bunch of RFIDs lying around and you're like, I really don't know what to do with these, we would happily take them off your hands. <laughs> So yeah, so we are, we're getting to this. I don't know why I've got 8,000 acres. It's more like 14,000 acres. Um, we do have a short list of ranches that we're currently looking at to implement the study on. Uh, this really is the slide where I would open this up to the audience and say that if any of you landowners out there and you think you have a, a, a ranch that's big enough and potentially suitable for the study and you would have some interest in this, we would love to talk to you about it and would really appreciate the, the opportunity opportunity. This obviously leads to a lot of follow-up questions too, um, because of the intensive nature of this project. Trust me, we, we came up with a million different ideas when we were coming up with this um, research uh, proposal. We then came up with the idea, hey, we might need to put this in two phases. We just we just don't have the manpower or the capital to be able to do everything at once. But down the line, we would like to look at things like the timing of putting this feed out there, the intensity, duration. Again, this all gets back to what we were, we, we've been seeing a lot of um, over the past few days. If you've got really, really good environmental conditions and the birds don't need the supplemental feed, how effectively are we going to be able to, to administer the medication in those conditions? These are all going to be very important questions. Um, 
we, we, we do plan on reusing equipment and study sites. Um, I will say there are some incentives for landowners in here. If you'd be willing to let us use your property and maybe purchase some of the feeders, um, on a cost share with us, with, with us, well, then you get to keep those feeders when we're done. So again, um, all of these questions, we, we could build a whole new study design on this. So we're really looking at this at, as being a multi-year project and, and potentially a multi-phase project as we uh, learn more. Before I wrap up, because I'm, I'm sure we're going to have some questions on this, I put this um, picture of a smoking barrel up there. We're, we're not jumping into this feet first on the exclusive premise that we're going to solve the quail decline with this. We might. We don't know. But if we can look at this research and we can improve quail survival by knocking back these parasites by 5%, 10%, if we add that to another increase in survival by good habitat management of 5%, 10%, before we know it, we've improved quail survival by 10% annually. And that's huge. The, this really is is or sus subscribes to the analogy of death by a thousand cuts. We're obviously hoping that great, you know what, this is going to going to really make a huge change for for our birds, particularly here in the rolling plains. But if we can get a five percent increase, a ten percent increase, that's fantastic. Again, we're not necessarily looking for that smoking gun. We're not we're not hanging all our hats on on this one question, but we do think it's a very important question that we need to look at. And with that, I will take any questions. Well, I'll start at the front and work my way back. I know this medicated feed is in its infancy. Are there concerns about resistance buildup? So the, the question was, with the medicated feed being in its infancy, are there concerns about um, buildup, resistance buildup? So, so that's a good question. Um, with it being um, FDA approved, we haven't, well, as far as I know, we haven't seen that yet. A lot of the research that's been done at the Wildlife Toxicology Lab hasn't been released yet pending the FDA approval. So we don't think that's the case. Um, at this point, we're not even sure if that question has been addressed um, under the FDA guidelines. Um, it's a difficult one to get at when you're taking the laboratory testing ground and then applying it to wild populations. So the best answer I can give you, unfortunately, with that is I don't know. Um, but but we should see that if there is a resistance buildup, well, I say that with the quail only living about a year to two years long, they really probably won't have much of an opportunity to build up a resistance to it. Um, based on the average lifespan of a quail, they may only get two, three treatments at most. Um, I, I, I'm no expert on the subject, but I doubt that that would be very uh, enough time for them to build up a resistance or for the parasites to build up a resistance. So uh, just to your timeline question, um, you get FDA approval tomorrow, just hypothetically. Is one of your first steps to roll out a, making it publicly available or is that waiting until 2031 until you have an idea of distribution and time release. Uh, no, so I might I might lean on Joe for that. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday, as soon as we can get it in production, we have a yep. chief company in Toledo, Texas. Brian, Brian uh, has, has been they did all the, the stuff for our testing. We've been testing this for four, three and four years, and they're ready to go. Uh, they just wait on label instruction. We talk about producing a bunch of it and then slapping a sticker label on there. But we felt like uh, that would put get a little carport over. So we're going to have the production within months of, uh, of the approval. And then we'll be able to drug the feed store. They have 180 outlets that they ship to the wrong place. Yeah. 
follow up with that though, if you don't know how it's supposed to be applied to the landscape, and it's an efficacy on the landscape, and you don't know when to apply it, how to apply it, is that not irresponsible? Uh, no, so based on the FDA studies, um, there are guidelines on when to apply it and how to apply it. We just want to test on the landscape how effective it is. We know from the FDA testing that the feed isn't killing the birds. Um, so, you know, if you're putting it out there and let's just say hypothetically it's not really effective and, and it's not working as well as we thought it would on the parasites, well, heck, at worst, the birds are still getting a free meal. Yeah, there, there are three branches of testing and all three of them are pleased with the results. Yeah, so I've, 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 I've spoken to everybody that's been involved on the three um, ranches where it was tested on small scale. And, and again, this is very anecdotal, but all three of them showed positive, pro positive responses. Yes, sir. John, is there any chance of breaking the cycle somewhere between the insects and the eyeworm? Well, I, I guess theoretically, um, if, oh, sorry, yes, sir. Um, is there any chance of breaking the cycle between the parasite um, in, in the host, um, with, which is in, in insects, and, and getting into the bird? Um, again, uh, you know, I really wish James Martin was with us, um, who's an expert on this. Uh, theoretically, if we were able to knock down the parasites enough in the birds to, to impact the parasite's reproductive cycle, Yes. I would suspect, though, with a parasite like this and with, with quail being the way they are, that breaking that life cycle would be extremely difficult. And, and certainly, if anybody else is, is a parasitologist and has more information on that, I'd welcome feedback on that. Yes, sir. Uh, I know, obviously, time and money and all that, but any, uh, any ideas of looking at non-targets that will also be using those feeders and then access the medication? So again, um, through the FDA testing that, that was all looked at, that's obviously a very big concern. Um, and as far as we know to date, there's no concern from that. Um, there's also no residual buildup in the quail. Um, so the, what I mean by that is if a hawk comes in and eats that quail, there's no secondary effects, negative secondary effects on on the, the raptor, say. So the FDA did study? They did. So Dr. Kendall at um, the Wildlife Toxicology Lab, that was all part of it. Yeah. Larry, I'm not answering your question. You stole my print from me. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, 200 acres per feeder, five acres, four acres per bird, that's 50 birds. Going to one feeder, you've got 150 pounds in that feeder. How long do you expect it? I mean, it, that seems like a lot of medication and an extended time for 50 birds to consume 150 pounds. What do you, what are you thinking that is? Like two months and then you move it or? Yeah, Larry, that's a great question. Um, again, we really don't know how effective it's going to be at getting that medication out to the birds. Uh, so the question for, for those of you in the back who couldn't hear is, how long do we expect that feed will be in the feeder before the quail come in and essentially deplete it? Right, Larry? Um, we, we really don't know. Again, anecdotally, we think it takes two to three weeks. Joe wants to contribute. It holds 150 pounds. Yes, sir. Medicated, we only put a 50 pound bag in it. It generally lasts, uh, it gets really hit hard, you might have to rebuild the one and then two, three weeks period. Right. But if it's not hit hard, it should last one bag, which is $35, which is 50 pounds, which should last. And the reason it's 150 pounds you can leave it up there all year to still a Milo. This is a crumble. Yep. It's Milo and items and other things, and it's coated with the benzol. So it's, it's not all 100% benzol. So you're saying that a typical treatment would be for three weeks, 50 pounds, yep. and you monitor. That's correct. Okay. Correct, yeah. So it would be 150 pounds. Spring, 150 pounds for theory. In, in total. 50 in each feeder. Each time for medicated, and then you want to load it up with Milo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. 150 total feet. Okay. Yes, sir. So, are you, do you 
you have something in place to monitor your non-target species that may be using the, the feed, so the Scoby feeder and the Timpian? Absolutely. So um, a great person to, to chat to on this would be Ronnie Kendall in the back. Um, these feeders have been designed extremely, extremely well to limit non-target species coming in. But we are planning on putting trail cams in the feeders, inside the feeders, so we can monitor that. I mean, obviously, we don't want something else coming in there and hammering all the feed out of it before the quail quail even get a chance. Um, but um, we've actually got one of the quail safe feeders out there um, from Ronnie Kendall. Go and take a look. He'll give you a great demonstration on it. They're, they're really, really effective at providing feed and limiting that to, to quail. Anybody else? I'd like to say one thing. I, I want to address this, and I probably should have said it in my talk. There's a great deal of suspicion around this, and I think a lot of it has to do with... Okay. I think there's a lot of suspicion around this whole program, and I think a lot of it has to do, if I go back in history, that Ron Kendall, Dr. Kendall, the Wildlife Toxicology Lab, has been paranoid about putting giving, giving samples of this feed to five or six different organizations having different results and not being able to control the, the FDA described a very specific protocol. So he's, it's been like the Oppenheimer project. It's been in secrecy. It's been paranoid. It's like, I don't want it to get out. I don't want somebody else to muck up the study. I don't want to confuse the FDA. And it's unfortunate, but there is some people like, why can't I get samples of it? They didn't even give samples of the Rolling Plains to test. Why can't I, uh, why can't you give me all the your research? Why can't you just share everything you've discovered? And and it's frustrating for everybody, but I think he's chosen to do that because he's working through one contact at the FDA who's told them not to let this get out of control. And so once it, the reason we're spending a couple million dollars to test it is to validate what Dr. Kendall did to the satisfaction of the FDA. But I wish we could have had this much more egalitarian and a lot of people could have been running these parallel tests, but that's not the way you get something through the FDA process. So it's kind of like in sales, when you get the yes, you stop selling. And we got the yes, and soon we can validate and test 10 different ways and it'll be available to every resource organization and every rancher, hopefully in the next few months. So I apologize for the secrecy and that's unfortunate for all of us. So. Thanks. Right, well, um, any, any last minute questions before we move on? All right. Um, well, I think we're about to give away some door prizes and a TV. Jay, do you want to? We'll do that. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, sure. You want to draw it out of? We're going to draw for a TV. If you want to purchase a membership, everybody who purchases a membership, we've got a TV and a sound bar just in time for football season. So. Uh, Mary will help you out if you want to join as a member. Everybody who already has their names in the box, so uh, feel free to come over there. Thanks, Jack. All right, we're going to take a, um, well, I guess a 20-minute break to the quarter past 10. Is that what it says, Kelly? On the okay. <laughs>
please complete those evaluations and turn those into Dana. You get a special door prize ticket for another large big screen TV, but only for those that's turned in the app, the uh, evaluation.
from now. We want you right out here on the front steps in two minutes so we can get a group photo. All Quail Masters alumni right out there on the front steps in two minutes. <laughs> All Quail Masters alumni meet me right outside the door. Thank you.
Get your door prize tickets out. We are flushed with door prizes, and Tyler's going to grab us some winners now. 74. This is for the seeds. Turn seed coming. 74. Got a winner? Okay, thank you. All right, our next item will be this uh, Yeti cooler from Capital Farm Credit. Two thirty-two. Two three two. Got a winner for that. Two three two. Going once. Going twice for the Yeti. Going three times. Draw again. One fifty-six. One five six. One five six. I've never had such a problem giving door prizes away. Four again. One sixty one. One six one. One six one. Your odds are getting better each time. <laughs> Two thirty eight. Bingo. I think I heard somebody say. All right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Next, we have uh, we have a uh, collection of items here from uh, Park City's Quail, including two caps, a his and hers Yeti mug. And a hunting vest, I believe, is also by Park City's Quail. So, uh, again, there's your good hunting outfit. Who we got, Tyler? 123. 123. 123. Anybody? Try again. 143. One, four, three. Got a winner? Better speak up now or forever hold your peace. Okay, our last items for this. Oh, we got two more, two more. We got uh, from from uh, Quail Forever. We have this nice ammo case as well as uh, two Yeti mugs with that. So who we got, Tyler? 50. Number 50. Winner? All right, somebody's coming forward. All right, and our final door prize for this session, we have a trail, a stealth cam game camera donated by Stealth Cam, and we have a copy of Bob White to the Rio Grand Plains by Val Lehman, donated by Tom Patillo. 219. 219. Got a winner? Outstanding. Diaz Murray. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tyler. We'll call more. We'll have still quite a few door prizes at the end of the session. Who purchased the two the quail hunt at Croton Creek? Croton Creek Ranch. The half day quail hunt up there. On the silent auction last night. We don't have any record who got that. Anybody? Dan, it looks like me and you'll take that. Okay, uh, I'll turn it back to Raymond Morrow and we'll get started with the final session. I'm a little disappointed you didn't call my number. You still got a chance unless it's over. All right, welcome back. Hope you all enjoyed your muffins. <laughs> Up next, we've got um, Dr. Brad, which Brad do we have? Dr. Brad Dabbert, Texas Tech University. And Dr. Dabbert, I don't have your bio in front of me, but known him a long time. He's done a lot of good stuff. Started the Quail Tech program, what, how many years ago was that? 
how many years ago? Uh, 10 years ago, or actually 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Yeah. So Brad Devert, everybody. I'm have your bio up here. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, well, first of all, it's an honor to be here among uh, so many people interested in quail and excited about quail. Um, and among uh, so many good speakers that are interested in uh, trying to benefit the populations. Um, I've been at Tech uh, for about 26 years. I'm the um, uh, Burnett Foundation Endowed Professor of Quail Ecology there, and we're in the Department of Natural Resource Management within the Davis College and um, Dale asked me to talk about our, our program there to kind of give an overview and not talk a lot of, uh, about specific research projects but um, what I'm going to do is try to uh, review uh, you know 10 years of stuff and uh, just a few minutes here so we won't go into a lot of huge detail it'll be more about um, why we did things um, some of our major findings and kind of what direction we're going now um, a little bit nostalgic, a little bit eclectic. Some of you may think a little bit eccentric, uh, but that's kind of where we're, we're headed here. Um, I want to put up front um, the many contributors to this work over the years. Uh, Mr. Chuck Riblin, uh Jim Cohn, the Burnett Foundation, Bromberg Charitable Trust Fund, uh, several Quail Coalition chapters. Uh, Quail Coalition is a huge um, uh, sponsor of our work. Uh, takes parks and wildlife and then a lot of individuals and ranches as well. Um, I really stand on the shoulders of, of uh, the people that really do the work. Some are in this room, uh, really proud of all of them. Um, and, and those are the list of the graduate students. There'd be too many undergrad research texts to list, but uh, those as well. I want to start out a little bit nostalgic here. Um, why I love quail. I was going through some family records not too long ago and found this picture here on the far left of my great uncle Adley. That's a picture of 1971. He was a real hero and mentor of mine. He raised um, LQ pointers. Um, this one's Freckles. That was a champion. Uh, I wasn't there for Freckles, but I was there for um, Redwater Rex and Ike and Ace and Mike and all those dogs that, uh, that were really a part of my childhood that brought me through to having dogs myself um hunting with my family and then finally back here in june that bottom right corner uh still gives you that passion to get up at 4 a.m go on a chick capture um and um really still love it as much as i did back then so we started our work in 2010 um with a two-faceted approach uh, had broad scale monitoring of Bob White and scale quail populations across the rolling plains. Uh, it was primarily call counts and predator indices, um, and it provided a really useful broad scale data set of population trends um, on differing ranches with differing uh, amounts of management. We also had targeted research projects which were designed to try to move the needle to benefit quail populations um, in our target area and and we really wanted to be on working cattle ranches for the most part because that is where um, a lot of the acreage is and that's the reality out there is that we are working in an agricultural landscape <laughs> We wanted our research to be very data driven. And by that, I mean, we wanted to measure what is gonna impact the quail population um, and really try to integrate that into our approach of management tools. We wanted tools that we could see how we're affecting the population and try to develop those. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do to move the needle as far as demographics. Um, honestly, it's not that hard to, to monitor the birds. You can catch them and put a radio on them. Um, it's hard to be able to come up with creative ways to actually move that needle. And it is expensive 
inexpensive as well. Um, this particular bird that we're showing here, one of the things we try to do over time is use a lot of technology. It's wearing a GPS uh, radio backpack style, and you know you can get a lot of data from this. Uh, you can get a, a location a minute if you want to, and um, so it's not really that hard for monitoring. It's hard to come up with ways to, to change things. And so our questions were, are we getting better survival? Do we see more nests, more chicks, and more birds on the ground in the fall? And I've got a, a, a target there because the problem is, you know, we're not in a laboratory. This is for all the, the scientists that are talking here. We're not in a laboratory. We've got a moving target. Um, we don't know if we're going to have four inches of rainfall or a 40 inch rainfall year. And so it makes it hard to have the same kind of conditions year to year uh, and, and test, these, uh, test these things. So when we started this in 2010, the atmosphere for quail was a lot of confusion um, because the perception was in the fall of 2010 that we had had a previous good year of rainfall in the spring, um, but there wasn't that um, population response to match that rainfall. And so this is kind of a, a not a good graph here on the side. It's old looking, but it is from the 1940s uh, and it shows you that population um, relationship with rainfall that has been there uh, for years and years and years and that's of course pretty clear more rainfall more cover more food um, equals more birds and so there was concern that maybe this age-old pattern was broken um, so what I did is I looked around and decided to go to a site with a really long proven track record um, that was using some intensive management tools that weren't being used uh, much in Texas. And so we went to Tall Timbers Research Station, uh, thankful to Bill Palmer, opened arms and, and uh, showed us there. We toured some of the plantations there. And what we saw were consistently high bob white density, eight coveys per hour in a lot of those places. Um, we saw first habitat management, broadcast supplemental feeding, broadcast in the habitat, and mesomammal predator reduction. Um, but as you analyze this, of course, between North Florida and Texas, you see that the climate conditions are quite different. Um, there's a lot more rainfall there, so there's a lot more food and cover. Uh, it's a lot warmer, of course, a subtropical type environment, and so the energy demands are not as bad there. And so what you see is that there, there's more food and cover available and less energy demands. So on the plane back from that trip, I started to think that, hey, I don't think my professors were really right about this intensive management stuff. Um, I think that maybe we should try supplemental feeding and this broadcast way because it hadn't been tried uh, that way in Texas as much as far as broadcasting in the habitat. So we started off with that one um, because it's the least controversial with the most likely success. Um, it makes, there's some ecological sense why lone um, barrel feeders and broadcasting on the road don't really work as well. There are some caveats there. Um, and we also had to modify that to work in the rolling plains of Texas. Texas. What surprised me was, is there was some opposition. I felt like uh, the outlaw country guys here um, in that, you know, some people were calling it artificial. Um, a lot of people accused us of ignoring habitat management, even though we tried to say you have to have the habitat first before you can do this. Uh, some people didn't like single species management. And what I really thought was, most of these people were taught the same thing I was. So, uh, and that is that you can't change any kind of carrying capacity type thing. You can't add feed to the system. None of that's going to work. So I ignored all that. Um, and we tried broadcast supplemental feeding on the four sixes ranch on a 14,000 acre pasture, um, at a rate of 300 pounds per mile over a portion of that. Of course we had controls. Um, and as you can see here, what we modify that too is to broadcast off um, the roads into the habitat and you can see those birds there are able to stay under cover and get that feed and um, over time 
what we saw is that we increased October to April survival an average of 22% over this four year study, including in wetter years. Um, and that's 22% more hens to start the nesting season. Um, we also improved reproductive performance. Uh, we tripled the number of re-nesting hens uh, during 2012. 15% of fed hens tried a third nest where no control hens did. And we lengthened the breeding season by 39 days. So um, I've got a picture. I don't have time to mention 10 years of research totally, but you guys probably recognize those are quail crops there. Um, those on the left, have, of course, have native seeds. One on the right has some of our water resistant um, protein feed that we actually broadcast in the habitat. We've seen some positive results with those in very dry years um, as far as clutch size and egg volume. Um, but we don't really have time to go into a lot of that. One thing that happened that was a big benefit, it was bad for the birds, but a benefit is our, we actually had a major winter storm during February 2014, where you actually get an average snowfall of three inches. We got a foot, which compacted down to about 10 inches, and that snow stayed around. Um, and we saw a lot of control birds die. Um, a lot of them have lost 40% body weight during those few days of temperatures in the teens. And if you look at the graph here, again, we're not going into the weeds as far as the stats and things for this audience, but what you see is at that blue is that snowfall event. The red are the birds that didn't get feed. Those dropped about 45, 50% survival down. Whereas our uh, birds that were getting the feed had about um, only about 9% loss. So that shows you that this can be a major factor, uh, especially during those events um, for snowfall. We were pretty convinced and have published on that, that broadcast feeding um, is pretty successful at increasing um, bird populations as far as that survival. So we're moving the needle there. We moved on to predator reduction. This is a little more controversial. Had been fairly untested in the rolling plains of Texas. Um, some previous experiments had used a trap for 49 acres. We experimented with um, predator reduction on 6,000 acres on the four sixes and we use a trap for 20 acres on those treatment sites. Um, if you look at the data here, um, what you see is that over four years, though we see some changes as far as where we are on this scale, um, we have about an average of 12% increase in nest success um, with the predator reduction. Um, and this, of course, if you look at, um, I can show you the math later if you question me, uh, but essentially this leads to about a 30 percent increase in chick production um, because you've got a 12 percent increase in nests which are going to be uh, 12 to 15 eggs or so and so that is your your increase there so we have four years of that um, and so again this data is is uh, a little more complex less confident in it but we're still taking a look at it but again trying to move that needle we're increasing survival rate now of adults now we're increasing nest success so in 2022, we ended our broad scale monitoring. Um, what we were seeing was kind of the same kind of thing. And Parks and Wildlife does a good job of monitoring uh, birds um, with their roadside counts. And so we really wanted to focus in on what we saw as the major issues that are occurring right now. Um, one of those is that the least really studied area of Bob White uh, demographics is chicks. They're hard to catch, they're cryptic, they're hard to mark. Um, and so we really wanted to try to understand that and see if we can affect uh, that demographic within the population. Um, we also wanted to develop methods to deal with drought. Um, 
you know, we talk about sustainable populations and, and these kind of things and trying to even things out, but we're never really going to be able to totally do that because of the changes in environmental conditions that we have in this area. Um, you know, this, where the mark is, is in Dickens County on this map. Um, even though we had 15 and a half inches of rain April to July, um, you can see the abnormally dry is creeping in on our study side right now. Um, and so that is a factor that, that we're, we're dealing with and we need to try to figure out ways to deal with drought um, because it really does shut down reproduction. Our current project on the Pitchfork Ranch is in the Shinry pastures that targets chick survival and drought. And Chuck Rybelin and Jim Cohn are our major contributors on this. The umbrella portion of this project, the umbrella experiment is an integration of uh, predator reduction and feeding, broadcast feeding. Um, and we're really, again, ex trying to examine chick survival, bob white density, and hunting success. Um, we're also trying to examine um, a new chick feed pellet that we're developing um, that will also be broadcast into the environment to try to deal with drought. Um, and then we're trying to simply understand chick survival and try to figure out what's the best brood habitat, are there management things that we can do to increase chick survival, um, and just what is out there as far as environmental conditions, predators, all these kind of things. To talk about drought for a second, um, the influence of precipitation on game bird populations is huge. Uh, each spring as the life cycle is controlled by the photo period, uh, receptors in the brain and the eye of the birds detect increasing light hours. Uh, this causes the hormones to increase their gonads to grow and they become reproductively active in nest. Unfortunately, uh, drought and primarily basically food limitation can short circuit that process because of stress hormones and essentially what it can do is it can shut down um, reproduction. So what in the heck can you do about drought? Um, well, you can't grow anything that's not irrigated. Um, so no food plots, can't put native grassland in. None of those things can happen when you only get a couple inches of rain during the growing of the breeding season. So what you can do is you can closely monitor your grazing, stay on top of that um, so that you can save as existing much existing cover as possible. Um, and then I'll show you a little evidence here that we may be able to throw some energy and nutrients out there so that we don't bottom out um, like we do in some of these really severe years. I'll give you an example. Um, the first year we did our study on the four sixes, we were hit with what they called a hundred year drought. <clears throat> and what happened was hens that did not receive any feed, only 15% of those attempted a single nest during that year. And chick survival was essentially zero. If you look at the two graphs here, 2011 there is on the right. Um, and what you see is, uh, is basically very poor chick growth. And because that is because there's no insects available. Um, and so... The interesting thing is you're still seeing 5.8, 5.9 that first uh, few days. Well, that's because those birds are running on the yolk. Um, and so essentially it's a very poor year for chicks. 2012, you got a little bit better rain. You can see that chick growth increases. Um, and so the, the picture on the far right is actually our, our adult feed. But again, we're experimenting with ways with nutritionally trying to broadcast this water resistant feed um, so that we can try to deal with drought and change the demographics in drought. So you're probably thinking that dude's crazy. I don't blame you. It is a little bit of alchemy here. You know, if we can get uh, chicks to eat um, a broadcast feed, but I'll tell you why I want to do this. Um, the map on the left, probably a little hard to read, but essentially what that is telling us is that in 2011, um, 85% of the hens that got feed 
actually had at least one nest. So even though it was a 100 year drought, we broadcast uh, Milo, 85% of hens tried to nest. They brought those broods to the feed line, but because Milo sorghum uh, is only about seven to nine percent crude protein. Chicks need 28, 30 percent. Um, you don't get any growth. And so the alchemy here is I know the hens will breed, will bring the broods to the feed line during a drought. Can I make chicks eat a chick pellet? And so flash forward now to 2022 from 2011, our first year again um, of study on the pitchfork, we were hit with a terrible drought. We only got four inches of rain um, through the end of, for the first year through the end of July. We had 50 days of 100 degree weather um, through, from, through the end of July. And so essentially in our control, no radio mark birds produced any chicks in that area, but we're able to produce normal weight chicks in our treatment area. So there's some positive data that's starting to come through about our chick feed. We're excited to see what happens with this year's data. We still have nests out there right now. Switching over from that, um, talk a little bit about why chick radio transmitters. Well, we feel it's important to try to look at uh, cost specific and individual survival of chicks. Uh, chicks are cryptic and hard to catch. Um, again, it's the least understood portion of the life cycle. Um, and we need cost specific mortality uh, and individual fate information. So this male here on the right uh, was actually uh, in a capture on the day I showed early in early June. Um, and we weren't expecting him to be there. Uh, we were actually homing in on a hen that was wearing the radio. Um, she had chicks. He was there with chicks. And the chicks were totally mixed in between uh, the two of them during the brooding. And he had about eight chicks under him. So it's difficult to determine chick survival um, unless we are able to um, individually mark these chicks and follow them through time. I'm happy to say this year we have um, much better conditions on our, our site. Uh, even so, we are able to, uh, we're about doubling our chick production on our treatment area as compared to our control area. So we're, so we're really excited about all of that. Um, finally, I want to say uh, we also are really interested in education. We have a lot of undergraduate students, uh, research technicians, we have graduate students, but I've always wanted to get into the grade schools to try to uh, talk to um, that level so we can capture that uh, interest. Uh, my my uh, wife and my daughter are both elementary school teachers. And so we've got an awesome opportunity that's about to happen. We're partnering with Texas Farm Bureau Insurance. Uh, we're going to have an actual live stream from the field on September 26. Um, and that's going to go into, as of Monday, it was 2,800 um, K through fifth grade classroom. So we're estimating between 50 to 70,000 elementary students are going to hear um, our message uh, about Texas Tech quail and quail. Um, there's also an accompanying booklet, which is going to help uh, teachers integrate lessons into the classroom. And um, this is the, the back page of that. Um, it'll allow them to integrate quail um, into the essential knowledge and skills that they have to teach. Um, so they'll spend quite a bit of time on that. And we're hoping to really uh, capture a lot of those teachers and the, the uh, elementary students' attention and excitement about quail. So. Um, I know that was kind of a, a flying trip through 10 years and some of the things that we're doing. Um, there's more information at texastechquail.org, and we also have social media um, and e-bulletins. And with that, I will hopefully keep us on, on time here, and I don't know if we have time for questions or not. He said, I got five minutes for questions. Yes, sir. The chick feed, is that commercially available? 
Uh, no, sir, not yet. No, we're still testing that. Yes, sir. What about the schedule for the live stream in September the 26th? You have, have you already selected what schools that goes to? Yeah, the Texas Farm Bureau was doing that, and the registration ended on Wednesday, unfortunately. They don't have a patent on that, do they? Because I'm probably going to try to steal that. <laughs> What's that? The, uh, the, the screening in the classrooms. Oh, uh, you have to talk to them. Gotcha. Did you have a name with the, the them? Who's the them? Um, the Farm Bureau. It's um, the edu it's the educational outreach portion, and the lady's name is Jordan Bartels. Okay, I appreciate it very much. Y'all have a good day. Thank you so much, Brad. Hello, up next we have an, our second Brad of the day, Dr. Brad Kabeca. Where is the Following his PhD from the University of Georgia, Brad jointly served as executive director of Rolling Plains Research Foundation and director of Tall Timbers Western Piney Woods Quail Program. He spent the last 10 years studying quail from the Rolling Plains of Texas to the Red Hills of North Florida. Today, he will be discussing Tall Timbers Western Piney Woods Quail Program based in the Piney Woods of East Texas. And I'll personally say I've gotten to know Brad and really enjoy it. And I'm super excited about the work he's doing. So, good luck. I'll let you know. All right, thanks for that introduction, Raymond. Uh, thank you all for sticking around to the very end, to the bitter end. Uh, you know, it was about eight years ago that I, uh, after spending a few years studying a little bit uh, Bob White and Scaled Quail in South Texas and West Texas, that I began visiting the the Red Hills region of North Florida. Now, if you don't know much about that geography, there's about 400,000 acres of properties that have never lost their quail populations in the southeast called the Red Hills region uh, of, of North Florida. It's between Tallahassee and Thomasville, predominantly through uh, the, the judicious application of prescribed fire and, and timber practices that support wild quail populations. Uh, they've never lost their wild quail populations. And about five years ago, I had the good fortune to do my PhD at um, Tall Timbers and a few of these other properties with the University of Georgia. And over that time, I had the good, good graces to experience things like this, beautiful wild cubby flushes with uh, friends and partners with a beautiful backdrop of thin pine timber that's burned every other year. Stylish English pointers and setters, robust grasses, forbs, shrubs, what you'd expect. But what really seals the deal for you are these little guys, these English cockers. I don't know if many of y'all have had a chance to hunt with English cockers and have them ret retrieve that bird right to your hand or to your buggy or to the hunting wagon over there. And after a couple of years and towards the, um, the end of my PhD, I started thinking, gosh, why couldn't we do this in East Texas, in the Piney Woods region of um, East Texas? And it just so happened that about the same time, there were other folks thinking the same thing. Folks like Park City's Quell Coalition who were coming visiting the Red Hills um, and, and other individuals I said, you know what, I think we could do that. And so that was really the impetus to, to the idea of the Western Piney Woods Quail Program. There wasn't a whole bunch being done in the Piney Woods region of Texas as far as research or management. So we thought this is a, a really good opportunity to do something, and there seemed to be support. So before really getting into what our program is about, the Western Piney Woods Quail Program, I want to first start by saying thank you to those groups that were incredibly influential to getting our program started. First and foremost, Park City's Quail Coalition, who... who uh, who, and, and as well as the, the Greater Houston Quail Coalition, Quail Coalition in general has been a huge support for annual operating expenses, for getting up off the ground, but also, without a doubt, Mr. Chuck Ryblin, who seeded our endowment and started um, our Western Piney Woods Quail Program. Uh, 
the Gordy family of Houston has helped substantially on a project that you'll hear a little bit more about today, as well as Texas Parks and Wildlife supporting our work uh, regionally, um, both programmatically and uh, project-wise, as well as the East Texas Gateway Quell Forever uh, chapter and, and some anonymous donors. We couldn't do this without support from partners and synergism from partners and collaborators. So really appreciate your support and, um, and hope to garner your um, future support as well. So with that, what is the Western Piney Woods Quail Program? Well, we're an affiliate of Tall Timbers, and you're about to hear from Dr. Palmer about a little bit more about Tall Timbers, but what you need to know for now is that Tall Timbers is a research station in Land Conservancy. Within the research station, it's kind of structured like a university of multiple departments. Uh, our department is the Game Bird Program, and we study Eastern Wild Turkey and, and Bob Whites. And within our game bird program, we have multiple satellite programs. They're not just projects. Some have been around 30 years. Some of them are fully endowed. Um, they're full-fledged programs. And, and our program um, is the Western Piney Woods Quad Program, which started in 2020. Our goal is to conduct pragmatic and novel research to restore huntable bobwhite populations to these regions and then take that research that we're doing locally and then disseminate that through outreach, things like this, field days, workshops, and then site visits, consultations, things of that nature. And one last thing that we're doing is working with public land opportunities in East Texas. There's a lot of public land opportunity in East Texas, and that's a, a topic of interest that's, um, inter that's uh, important to our board. And so uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about each one of these topics, from research to our outreach to our public land efforts. And uh, yeah, with that, when I talk about East Texas, and what am I really talking about? I'm talking about the Piney Woods of East Texas. Some folks think, well, maybe just East I-35. Specifically, I'm talking about the Piney Woods, characterized by historically longleaf pine. Now it's uh, trad traditionally uh, more loblolly and um, slash um, pine. But it's the 13 million acres that hugs the, the east part of, of Texas. And historically, a lot of researchers would have considered this the quail capital of Texas. And so some of you may have seen this, this chart before, but this is a, these are roadside count data from Texas Parks and Wildlife. And they caught some of the good old days through, from the 70s. That Parks and Wildlife Roadside Survey started in 1978, and they caught some of that early stuff. And within a few years, it, the populations were pretty much gone. It happened very fast. Um, and I'm going to explain how, why it can happen very fast here in a second. And it's maybe not something as uh, nefarious as we might think, but uh, there were still some populations and still are some wild birds in East Texas um, in certain areas, but very, very low densities. One of the reasons, or one of the, I guess, challenges that we have and one of the reasons that we can lose populations very fast is also one of our virtues in East Texas. The Piney Woods, I, it's needless to say that we get a lot more rainfall than South Texas or West Texas. Not only do we get more rainfall, but we can see from the line graphs to the, to the right, um, there's on the left y-axis, uh, axis is West Texas, that's Fisher County, and the right is East Texas. And what we see is that one, yes, we get more rainfall. Not only do we get more rainfall, it tends to be just a little bit more stable. So our coefficient of variation or how much um, variability we have in that rainfall pattern tends to be a little less in East Texas. Texas than, uh, than West Texas. But management is key. We can't do anything about rainfall, but we can do something about management. So looked at it a little different way, not just looking at rainfall, but uh, temperature and things of that nature. This is uh, some folks have had these pictures on their slides already with uh, the drought index and all this stuff, MesoNet and drought monitor. Polk County is that top. Um, Top, top image, and we can see that drought tends to be just a little bit more frequent in areas like Fisher County, and so that's a challenge that they have to deal with. We think of it as a virtue, we get rainfall, but it's also kind of a challenge in that we get so much rainfall that if we're not managing, we can lose our quail very, very fast. So one of the most notorious studies done at Tall Timbers, Tall Timbers established in 1958, but some of the early studies began in the 1920s in this region. But uh, when Tall Timbers, the property, was donated to the research station, one of the first studies they did started in, um, in the late 50s and the early 60s, and happened to be one, this, some of these, hopefully those images come up good uh, with the lighting in here, but one of the plots is known as NB66. 
And NB66, they said, this is a plot in 1966 that we're never going to burn again. Uh, this is an area that they know burning was important for quail, but what do we do? What happens if we just don't burn at all? So in 1966, they took a photo, and it's georeferenced with that letter A. And we can see by 1981, that same georeferenced pine tree right there. And it's nothing but sweet gums and hickories and oaks. He definitely wouldn't be able to run bird dogs in that and see your pointers and English setters like I would showed earlier. It had grown out of habitat in 15 years. Now, there's, there's probably some pictures they took between 1966 and 81, but it was gone. And there were no quail, and no quail that really used that. 15 years later, it looks about the same. In 2001, I can tell you it looks not much different today than that 2001 photo. There's litter on the ground, no grasses, no forbs, just very choked up. And what we see is that the birds don't really use this kind of habitat. So there, that happens to be a brood I tracked during my PhD, the stars where it hatched out, the circles are daytime use, uses, and the black dots are its nocturnal uses. And what we see is pretty much they completely avoided NB66. But it's, I'm not just Cherry picking this data. Um, here's 400,000 quail locations <laughs> over the last couple of years, and that little circle blue right there um, is NB66, and there's maybe 180, I think, locations with NB66, of which about half of those were dead locations. So uh, we were pulling out collars that had been mangled up from either hawks or, or meso mammals. So this is not quail habitat, but it is also predator habitat. But most of the southeast looks like this. We've lost our culture of prescribed fire. And it's one of the key things that we can do to manage for quail in this part of the world. So we know fire is important, but we can't just put fire back into these, these systems like the 1981 and 2001 system. We'll have to go in, do some mechanical work, open it up. But once we open up that, that forest to sunlight, to the forest floor, it's going to want to grow ground cover because we get 50 inches of rainfall a year, sometimes 70 inches of rainfall a year. Um, a bad year, like right now, we've already got 30 inches and we're like, oh my gosh, it's dry. <laughs> so we know once we open up the, the canopy that it's going to want to grow ground cover and we have to burn and we're burning every other year. Um, every piece of ground is seeing fire every other year. So knowing this and having a, a strong, long uh, uh, kind of history of this research in the southeast, say what, what if we did that in East Texas? What if we opened up uh, a pine stand, start thinning, burning, doing all these things that tend to work in the southeast using that blueprint and then modifying, adapting based off of what we see locally on those conditions. And, and let, let's see if we can do that in East Texas. So now I want to share a case study of something that we've been doing, a project that we've been doing the last couple of years. So the Gordy family of Houston said, we'll get behind this. We needed a property that we could do a project. And um, so he said, OK, on this property, let's identify a focal area that we're going to start on, really work on, um, and then move out from there. And we'll see, we'll monitor the quail population within the focal area and on the outside of the focal area and on neighbors and see how that population responds over time in relation to management. So they started a prescribed fire program. They began thinning. Uh, they started some of this earlier than, than we started our, our monitoring and research with tall timbers. They had started thinning. Um, but we began, we started our call counts and fall covey counts in 2021. We didn't hear any birds in 2021. We didn't hear any birds in 2022. There's no population response. So we built it, but they didn't necessarily come. That might work in some landscapes where birds are still on, you know, somewhat abundant on the landscape. East Texas, we might have a bird to 10,000 acres still. <laughs> it's very low density. So 2012, this is what the aerial image really um, would look like for that part of the world. Just row pine timber like most of East Texas. It's not quail habitat. Um, in 2018, they began thinning and burning for size reference. Those blocks with these roads right here, if you can see my cursor, that's about uh, 550 acres. So this whole block is 750 acres. So they began thinning and burning, still no response. By 2022, it looked like this. Still no response. On the ground, this is a, a longleaf stand that hadn't been thinned. Ended up thinning it and doing a little bit of um, mechanical control. And within about a year and a half, that ground cover looked almost like a South Georgia quail plantation. So it can happen quick. Restoration can happen quick, whereas if we do that in, in South Texas or West Texas, we might wait 15 years. And if you mess up, you might be 15 years behind, too. We have a little more flexibility there. So. We didn't see a response and they said, well, 
this would be the ideal candidate for translocation because it seems like you've done the work, but there hasn't been a population response. We could wait another 10 years, but uh, you know, who really wants to wait 15 years before they maybe see some quail? So uh, we said, okay, let's let's uh, let's do a translocation. So earlier this year, we brought 120 uh, wild birds from North Florida to to this research site. Uh, 60 pairs is even sex ratio, about three to one age ratio. They came from Tall Timbers and Livingston Place. These are our, our two uh, properties that Tall Timbers owns in the Red Hills. And we have radio marked birds on both of those properties. So we were able to um, compare adult survival to birds. We, every single one of these birds got a radio collar. We can compare survival of those birds that we brought to the ones that we uh, that were still on the property that we just worked up and let go. And so this sample rep represents about 500 or 600 radio marked birds. We radio mark about 1,000 birds a year across our, our study sites in the southeastern U.S. Um, Tall Timbers had about 250 radio marked birds this year. Um, Livingston Place was 150, and then ours was 120. What we saw was that adult survival um, on our on this translocation was actually higher than those those populations that we brought our our, our birds from. So and those are stable populations that have been around for a hundred years or so. So that was very encouraging. We've seen a pretty good survival to date, about fifty six percent to seven and a half months. Um, for those that are familiar with quail ecology a little bit, you'll know that. Uh, on on average, you'll have about 20 to 25 percent annual survival. So this is good. Compared to other translocations in Texas, it's it's also been very encouraging to see this. Uh, these are some other translocations that just been, whether it be scaled quail, bobwhite, other other species, and uh, this is this translocation here, and it tends to be going very well. It's a different part of the world, has a lot more cover, a lot of different conditions, um, but here's just a few more um, studies that we we can look at, and it tends to be going fairly well. So we can look at survival, we can look at reproduction, um, and so far we found 71 nests this year. I hope the nesting season isn't over, but this is extraordinary reproduction from from a reintroduced population. So we're pretty encouraged by that. But when we started this project, we said, we don't want this to be just a typical translocation, turn them loose, let's see if it works. We want to extract as much data from this project, if we were to do this again without radio marked birds, that, if, that we know a lot about the bird. Um, and so pretty much every one of these nests, about 51 of these 71s um, nests have gotten cameras on them so we can look at what's taking our nests. It's actually our leading been, uh, cause of nest failure has been snakes, believe it or not. And that's not because we don't find eggs at the um, nest bowl. We've actually found 12 of our birds in the belly of a snake. We know for sure it was a snake. <laughs> um, but we, we've also had some other really cool observations as well, like pigs and raccoons and bobcats coming by a camera, um, but maybe not necessarily um, hitting a nest. So uh, it, we, we can look at a lot of different things. So we have a, a PhD student that's working on this, Trey Johnson. He has a poster off in the corner. Hopefully y'all saw that poster. There's a QR code on there that has even more information. Hopefully y'all go check that out. Um, but the idea is that we're going to try to extract as much information as we can. And then we can build models and, and fancy diagrams and figures. But when we want to show this to the, the folks that we're working with, Maybe that doesn't really mean a whole bunch to them. You know, 15, 20%, 25% shrub cover, what does that mean? So what, what we're trying to do is take that research and build an outreach component that makes it easy for landowners to comprehend just what we are talking about. So I've built this interactive map Every one of our, our nest locations we've taken photos at. And so I can send this to our landowner and say, here's our uh, quail. And this is in relation to burn units or non-burn units. We can see what they look like. I can click on one of these birds. If, um, so if you want to see what a, a nest. Uh, oh. Let's see if this works. Does it work now? How about that? Yeah. So if you want to say, okay, here's some green dots. Those are successful nests. The blue dots uh, were those that were still active. The red didn't make it. If you want to look at what a nest looks like in, uh, in a burned unit, we can say here's 151.916. It uh, successfully hatched 10 out of 13 eggs. It was in Beautyberry. That was its nest. And uh, here's what it looks like. And we can do that with every one of our, our quail locations. It takes a ton of data, but trying to 
bring the 21st century into our cloud research, essentially. Um, so using these, these things to really pair with outreach. Um, we're not going to publish, you can't publish really anything like this, but it's very, very useful when it comes to outreach, when folks want to see, what are you talking about when you're talking about these grasses and forbs and whatnot? So let's see if we're back online. We're back online. Yep. So we've been able to build those models, look at a lot of different things. One of the other questions we, we wanted to answer was, if we were to do this in the future, how large of an area do we need to, to have? And uh, when we have this amount of area, how do we need to manage in such a way that we, we know we have to burn? When do we need to burn? How large of scale do we need to burn? So that we're doing it in such a way that is least negatively impactful to quail and, and most has a, a greatest positive benefit. So we, we've been able to say, is, okay, is their survival better on property versus if they have we have a dis disperser? And do they disperse? And how large of an area do we need? So um, what we'll see from this, this animation, if it loads up, is about 99.5%, basically all of our locations have been on this focal area. They haven't dispersed off the property. Maybe over time we will document that. But so far it seems to suggest that we might, if, if we get the population stable and we have a certain number of birds, that we can get, we can do it on a scale of this size. Um, and we can also see from that animation when we started burning, when that happened, how they moved out of the areas that were burnt for about a month and a half, and then they start selecting farms. So you can see this middle dot right here. They're really hammering that burned area right there. So uh, if we would have burnt all that at a thousand acre scale, it probably wouldn't have been a very good idea. It would have displaced them for a while and then I had to move back in. So how we, we manage, we're trying to relate our research to management. So a lot of folks might say, well, Brad, that's great and all, but you know, that's probably really expensive. So in 2019, we actually did an article that compared um, some of this management in the southeast to that in, say, uh, West Texas or South Texas. So if, you wanna, if you're interested in the math, you can, you can take a picture of that QR code. It'll bring you to an article called uh, Making Sense of Quail Management. It's our whole newsletter. And it talks about how much we spent per acre and how we did that math. But what we found was that even if we spent five times as much per acre, it still costs three times more per harvested bird in a semi-arid environment that goes to drastic busts um, because some years you can grow a lot of birds it's not much per harvested bird um, but it, it would be a lot more in these last say four years to save the rolling plains where we, we grow a bird to 10 or 20 acres where we can have a lot more stable um, population in the southeast in the southeast east texas we don't go through big booms and bust like in semi-arid regions it tends to be a little bit more stable but despite this stability, virtually all of our public um, quail hunting opportunities in Texas occur in arid regions. Things like the Gene Howe and the Matador and the, uh, the Chaparral and, and uh, all these places, mainly because that's where the birds have occurred. But we haven't invested a whole bunch in a little more stable opportunities, kind of like investing most of our money in really risky stocks, but not having a whole bunch in bonds. And so we haven't had that opportunity to hunt year in and year out on public lands all the time. Um, so what we're, we're doing with the, our Western Pawnee Woods Quail Program is saying, can we work with the state and feds to identify areas that we can develop focal areas for upland birds, um, namely quail and eastern wild turkeys? We have over 650,000 acres of just forest service land in East Texas. But of that forest service land, we actually don't have any, um, any state-owned wildlife management areas in the Piney Woods of East Texas. It's the only eco-region in Texas that doesn't have, from what I've been told from some um, department um, biologists, it's the only eco-region in Texas that doesn't have a wildlife research and demonstration area that's actually under the state management. We have wildlife management areas on upland pine sites, but they're uh, part of the Forest Service, so at the end of the day, they make the decisions on the management. And so there's a lot of um, cooks in the kitchen, so what we're doing is trying to work with uh, policy um, decision makers and saying these are some issues that we have. We would like to have um, opportunity in East Texas. There's a lot of potential. Um, there 
there seems to be proof of concept that we can do this. It's been done in the Southeast, um, at least one year of encouraging data so far, um, working on this project in East Texas. So uh, can we do this on public lands as well as private lands? So we have a lot of potential. We're seeing some encouraging results so far. And, uh, and we look forward to even more encouraging results for the next couple of years. So with that, I'll take any questions that I may have. Yeah, Joe. Brad, when you look at the land value of a place that's a uh, forestry, uh, forestry versus what could be the potential for the value of that land if it were turned into a oil plantation, what do you? What's your guess on that? You know, about this? Is it possible to take it out of timber production and make just as much money in land appreciation? We're going to oil plantation. Well, I'm not a real estate agent, but I can guarantee you that a quail place is probably worth, I have to put a number on it, 50% more than a place that doesn't have a quail. Um, but yeah, and, and the two are somewhat compatible. Uh, they're obviously, the conventional timber approach is a 30-year rotation of loblolly pine and, and planting, and then going in there 10 or 15 years thinning pulp wood, and then one more thin and clear cut. Um, but you could manage for a higher quality product, product like poles, and on a longer term, you could work with partners um, and, and uh, seek cost share funding that helps for burning and for planting a long leaf that you can burn within about a year of planting, um, as opposed to loblolly, where you do you almost have to exclude fire from loblolly just because the first couple of years, first 10 years or so, it's really susceptible to fire. So uh, if we really seek just working with loblolly, it really kind of hinder, hinders us a little bit, but we can do it. Um, but yeah, the, the places with quail, if we can do this, I'd imagine it would be way more valuable than just and that, that's value is also, I guess, maybe a value statement, what you value versus I value. But in my opinion, it'd be way more valuable um, than a, a loblolly pine plantation. Brad, I have a question about uh, the communication with the uh, National Forest. Uh, is the, has there been any, I'm sure there's been some discussion, but what's the interest level? The interest level is good. Um, the, the question was, uh, what has the conversation been like with the National Forest? What is the interest? Uh, so there's a couple districts within that, that deep East Texas um, area. There's Sabine, Angelina, Davy Crockett, um, Sam Houston. Each one has their different issues and they have different shops. So there's a shop that'll be responsible for fire, one for silviculture, one for um, wildlife. So to get everybody on the same page and say, okay, this wildlife goal would take this, this would also require this of the fire shop, it would require this of the silviculture. But it's not just um, that, but there's also other partners, say, um, you know, groups that might come in and say, we don't want to cut a tree down. Um, so they have to take public opinion um, into account in addition to what they're able to do in, in terms of, do they have the resources to thin and burn at smaller scales? Um, there's a lot of little things that we're working out and saying, what resources through partnerships and collaborations can we provide, not to just be a thorn in your side, like everybody else wants something, right? Everybody <laughs> wants something when, when it comes to the Forest Service. We didn't want to be that person person that just came to him and just wanted something. Uh, we said, can we develop a group of partners that makes this easy and supplements, um, it's complementary to what you're doing that can help burn um, or can get this done and be an innovative in doing such a thing. So with that, I think it's been a lot more receptive. They've been a lot more receptive. To build on that, his question about in your comment about the other groups they're pushing back about not wanting a tree cut, what can the people in this room do to help positively push the Forest Service in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. So if the only people they hear from are folks that don't want to cut a tree down, then they're making concessions for those folks. Um, and interestingly, you know, forests um, are managed um, in the United States with a multi-use um, kind of approach for timber, for wildlife, for recreation. So everybody kind of have a, has a voice. It's not all science driven for wildlife. Um, so uh, they have to hear from folks like y'all that say, I'm interested in this and we should be doing something for quail and what can our group with Quail Coalition or Quail Forever or NWTF, the Turkey Federation or whoever, what can we do to make this easier so that the district forest um, leaders and the, the rangers and, and the, the commissioners and supervisors, forest supervisors know that this is something that the constituents want because it's your land, it's public land.
How do you reach out to them? Uh, you can find a lot of those emails online. If you get with me, I can give you their email. I can look that up and, and get you the, the emails for the folks that you're interested in. Each one of those national forests has a different point person, a different district ranger. Um, so it depends on where you're interested in. But if you Google U.S. Forest Service, East Texas, whatever forest you're interested in, you'll find a contact for a district ranger. Um, and that's that's who I'd start with. And then I would sign up for listserv emails. They send out emails, project scoping things when they want to do a project. They put out for public opinion. Get on that listserv. If you tell that person when you email them, I want to be on the listserv so I can provide public comment so that whenever they do get public comment, it's not just from people that want to do nothing. That's, that's what you got to do. You have to act. Brett, one more, more question. Where are we running out of time? Oh. Brad, off of the Forest Service land, has there been any support or resistance from the timber industry? <laughs> well, with the Forest Service land, they, they have a lot of their own, you know, it doesn't really matter because it's forest service land. Um, there, there is a lot of timber industry in East Texas um, in which, uh, you know, fire isn't really compatible, as I mentioned with the Loblolly um, kind of approach. With, with timber practices in, in the forest, you know, once it goes under contract for to be thinned, they can't burn it. So uh, they're usually burning and then they go under contract and hopefully it doesn't get delayed like from COVID so that it doesn't miss a fire. There's a lot of little nuances that are going into that. That's what they deal on the pub deal with on the public lands. On uh, corporate lands, uh, there are some groups that own up to a million acres of of land in East Texas. And uh, they provide walk-in access and some of that's gotten di more difficult this year, we actually lost 25,000 acres of walk-in public hunting access in East Texas because of the liability um, and different issues. So they said, we're not going to lease this anymore to the state. So we have a lot of challenges and threats to our opportunities to hunt in an area that has a lot of potential, um, but they need to hear from us. I'm gonna act. Is that Clint? Or one question. What is the area goal for these uh, places that y'all burn? The question was, what is our, our basal area goal? It's a timber metric for how many trees per acre, essentially, and it's 40 to 60 square feet per acre. Um, typically, we shoot for 40 because if you shoot for 60 within a few years, you're going to need to be thinning, so you might as well go straight down to 40. But ideally, uh, this property, the private property, is 40. The conventional wildlife cut in East Texas might be 80, or um, they shoot for 60, and it ends up being around 70. So it's um, once you have that kind of thick of pine timber, you have not a whole bunch of shade, you have a lot of shading, but yeah, there's a lot of nuances to there, but 40 to 60 roughly. One more question if we have time for. Okay, thank you for your attention. Brad, I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, we have one more speaker before our closing comments. Um, Dr. Bill Palmer of Tall Timbers. Dr. Palmer is the president and CEO of Tall Timbers. Tall Timbers is a not-for-profit research organization and a land conservancy with 14,000 acres under direct management, sustaining dense bobwhite densities in, of one to two quail per acre. Tall Timbers researchers Tall Timbers researches the ecology and management of fire adapted systems in the southeastern U.S. with emphasis on the bobwhite threatened species and application of prescribed fire. They work to provide public and private lands impacting over one million acres. Bill has focused his research career on understanding the bobwhite population, demography, and the effect of management actions. He's published over 50 research articles and is co-author on a book on bobwhite management. Bill. Good luck. All right. Thank you very much, Raymond. Appreciate that. I greatly appreciate being the last person to speak today except to wrap up by Dale. Actually, it's been really fun to listen to all the great work that's going on in Texas. I'm super excited for the fact that, uh, uh, as you'll see in my presentation, there's there's all elements of science and management going on and a lot of uh, encouraging younger people getting engaged, which is fantastic. I want to thank uh, 
Dale for the invitation to come out and do this symposium. It's my first time I've been to this one, and uh, it's a great crowd. And Dana for her assistance and all that stuff. And uh, and uh, it's been really really fun fun visit to see people. I've had old technicians and graduate students here, and uh, and you meet people and see people. I was reminded that they got me drunk once in Memphis, and I rolled down a hill. But that was like 1996, so you can forgive me. I've, I've, I've learned from valuable lessons over time. Uh, you can't run downhill as fast as you think you can. But I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of coil management, and, and, I, and it's... Um, it's important to into the whole timbers process. You saw a little bit with uh, a couple talks today, and and Brad's talk, and Brad's talk. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's important that we utilize the scientific method in a way that encourages managers to be involved, and that uh, ends up with outputs that people want. And that's a that's a philosophy we've always had, and so we're we're uh, trying to formalize that a little bit more with all the great young people we have working for the organization. I will announce if you haven't heard that uh, Dr. Dwayne Elmore is joining our team uh, starting next month. Super excited to have him come for multiple reasons. Not only is a super talented and wonderful individual, knows a lot about quails, bird hunter, but also um, he's got a lot of Western experience. So it strengthens our organization, uh, as Brad Kopechka does as well, but it strengthens our organization. So we're real excited about that. And and I also would be remiss if I didn't also thank all the people behind me that made all this stuff happen. Uh, we got a team of 100 people plus at Tall Timbers and probably 45 in the Game Bird program. And it, they're just wonderful people that uh, takes time to grow organically and get them up and running. Uh, thanks to Park City's Quail, Quail Coalition, Joe Kraft, and all these people are so important important in Texas to keep that message going, keep the fire burning and make something happen. So that's part, huge part of it. And I threw this little title in there, how co-production created the greatest quail hunting in the world. And that's a little bit of a jab. I'm just playing around, but we do have a lot of fun down there in the Red Hills and elsewhere. Uh, but, but really what I want to get to is how you think about how you apply your science. This is whether you're a grad student, biologist, scientist, or an area manager or a funder of science. If you really want the output to be good quail, um, the scientific method, it can be used in a lot of different ways. And, uh, and that's kind of what I want to touch on today. You've heard it a lot uh, so far in the presentations about the large scale de declines, but there are certainty folks are happening. You know, in the state of Georgia, they're predicting in the next 20 years that one to every 15 acres is going to be solar. Uh, that's nearly 7% of the state. Well, that's not going to be in the Atlanta metro. That's going to be in southwest, southeast Georgia. Uh, think about that. That's going to be a huge hit to the fragmentation of the landscape. I'm sure it's happening in this state. All, interestingly, I think Texas and Georgia are one of the leaders in moving toward uh, alternative energy, which is about 23% of our electric grid today. And in the southeast, you know, so it's not surprising that quail are going to continue to decline. It's going to be a fact. It's just a fact of nature. Look at fisheries. Look at most all species except the few that were pointed out are so generalist they live on cement. They're going to decline. And, and so that's a flaw. Think, keep that in the back of your head that we're fighting against that. And how do we apply resources and where uh, to keep quail going? So in the, in the 70s, it was our peak area in the southeast. And then we dropped off. And, and, and uh, it hasn't come back, uh, as you would imagine, in the southeast. And Texas is kind of the 90s. And a lot of things I'm hearing today remind me of what I heard at the first couple Southeast Quail Study Group meetings back in the 80s when biologists were getting together. We got this decline. What are we going to do about it? And um, I guess my warning to you all is you got a couple decades and you're fortunate to have remnant populations on large landscapes. And if you don't act now and turn it around, it will follow suit. But you have a chance. And as, as uh, John McLaughlin pointed out, there's a lot of energy and a lot of money coming. And it's going to take good science, good planning, a good application uh, to get it done. But you guys still have a chance. But you don't have long. Uh, landscapes are changing. And they're really the only place we have quail are where they're the focus, as you heard, uh, like the Red Hills, South Texas, Rolling Plains, or individual properties. So I'm going to run through a couple quick slides here on quail uh, science and talk a little bit about aspects that as you're a scientist or a biologist or a landowner or a hunter, 
uh, you, you, you'll pick up on these themes, but you know, we hear a lot about explanatory quail science and that, that is basically where we identify declines and we look at landscape characteristics and other factors, uh, habitat loss, genetic connectivity, all these sorts of things that might explain the decline. And it's very valuable information. It helps us kind of conservation planning and things like that, but it doesn't have really direct management implications, but it's important. Uh, we do quail science, habitat ecology. We saw a lot of that here. Tall Timbers has done a lot of that, where these graphs show, you know, the effect of basal area on density of quail or how burning, how quail utilize burned and unburned patches. It's fundamental to our understanding of space use, and that's one of the building blocks of science. It's one of the building blocks of management. It has some direct management implications because, you know, if quail like something, then you want to make more of it because hopefully that'll mean more quail. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, a good old uh, boy in North Carolina, I got my best pointer, Dale, a rip rap named Buster that I'd put up against any dog anywhere. Uh, he told me that, uh, you know, quail fly into booger holes, you know, these big thickets. And that's where they go. But he said, when I was a kid, there were none of those thickets. You could, it was burned. It was open cropland. And we had more quail. And so you start thinking those thickets are where quail go. But it might not be what quail need because it doesn't tie directly to quail demographics. And that's a very important thing is that in science, we need to understand the demographics of quail, the survival, the reproduction. And one point I want to make is, and you get a lot of this, you hear a lot of this a lot of the time, uh, that... And I'm going to pick on science a little bit, but you can have the exact same reproduction and survival rate, chick survival, nesting success, and have a bird per five acres or two birds per acre. But to get from a bird per five acres to a bird per two acres, you got to increase the demographics. It doesn't happen magically. You got to do something to the system to pump up the demographics. You got to increase survival. You got to increase nesting. You got to increase chick survival. You got to do something because you can have the exact same demographics to be stable at a bird per five acres as two birds per acre. And that's where management comes in. That's where we act, is pushing those demographics. Really important. And then we have the quail science techniques. Quail science techniques are fun. I've done it, a lot of researchers have done it. It's the best part. It's like when you learn how to find out what predator's eating a nest or you're radio tagging birds. This is critical to the building blocks of what we do as scientists is, is if, if you think you're measuring what you're measuring. And you hear that a lot because people say, well, we did flight transects for quail density. We, we, we think we know what the density is. We don't know for sure. But the effort that's happening for increasing our knowledge and our ability to do this accurately is critical to understanding the building blocks. So cubby call rates and cubby calls and you know measuring predator abundances and radio tagging birds, very commonly used in uh, the quail science arena. And then there's the quail science synthesis. This is the big picture stuff. You get this a lot too in science. That's where you take, as Fidel was talking about yesterday, all these studies and you pull them together and you say, what do they all mean? And uh, they meta-analysis and you start looking at it and this is where the theories come out in science. Usable space, Fred Guthrie's usable space hypothesis. Uh, Paul uh, Arrington's uh, compensatory mortality hypothesis. And, and those are interesting in science, but often don't necessarily have that much application on the ground. A little bit, but not a lot. And so the key point I want to make here is that sometimes, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is that the role theory plays and how it can affect us and how we think about things. And that can be good and bad. Well, the, the way Tall Timbers has kind of evolved this and co-production is working with our stakeholders, our managers as a team player and we were forced to do that because like a lot of these groups, we ask for your money. And so we need to be relevant. And so it's just part of the process, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're endowed and don't have to do anything to raise money, then you might drift. And tall timbers did drift. I'll talk about that a little bit in the pack in the, in the next several slides. But so we're, I can point arrows at ourselves. But co-production is a, is a really neat thing. It's where you sit down and you say, stakeholders, hunters, what do you want? Joe did a great job pointing this out yesterday. We need hunters to have quail. Uh, and it's problem solving. So one thing, like for instance, when I talk to a stakeholder, how many times have you heard a person say, I found too many quail today? <laughs> I've never heard that. 
I've heard them say they're wild as heck, but I've never heard them say they found too many quail today. So you sit down and you start thinking about these things. You say, you know, hey, what, what is the problem we're having here and how do we solve that problem? And it's very experiential too, uh, but it does rely on all forms of quail science, which I'll point out here in a minute. And it's long-term and it's iterative. And so that's why I take a little different approach than we heard yesterday in that we're being proactive, applying science in a process that incorporates the goals of people working together using common sense to manage the system to move it in the direction we want it to go. That's what managers do. And so, you know, that, that uh, is Lane Green there hunting, and uh, he was my predecessor and a wonderful guy who's passed away from us from this world. But, uh, yeah, he was a passionate bird hunter, and uh, he helped make tall timbers what it is today. So this is kind of in a nutshell graph, but um, you heard about context. Context is hugely important. Context creates the limiting factors that we have to deal with as co-producers, as managers and scientists. Drought, rainfall, too much timber, predators, food resources. There are limiting factors and that context is different in South Texas than it is in Florida, North Texas. But like Brad uh, Dabbert pointed out, you look at those limiting factors and instead of saying we have to deal with it, you figure out how to manage it. And that's a different philosophy. It's a hugely different philosophy. And managers, their job is to reduce the impact of limiting factors on quail populations. And that doesn't matter whether it's an individual site or a county or a nation. Their job is to reduce the impact of those limiting factors on quail populations. And that's what managers do. If you're not doing that, you're not having many quail. So the other aspect that's real important in this whole thing is monitoring. And you hear a lot about that. We do covey call counts. We do fly transects, you know, and you can monitor, every, you can't monitor everything, but you can monitor the big, big things. And that gives us kind of this background knowledge of what's happening. Quail are going up, quail are going down. They're more in a drought, more in a rainfall year, less in a drought year. But that's just background monitoring. It kind of provides information through time and it gives you some ideas. Well, I noticed when we had a lot of cotton rats, we had a lot of quail. Hmm, we've been monitoring both. All of a sudden, there's a lot of rats. We've got a lot of quail. What's going on there? Well, let's do a test and let's find out how it applies. And then the research comes in and sound science is very important here. Very applied, but very sound, where you come in and say, let's test that idea of what's going on. Does supplemental feeding change the rat population, change the quail population? Does burning at different scales? That's information. And if you, if you run your research like this within these cuts, it doesn't matter what context and the limiting factors are all differ. The concept's exactly the same. And then over time, because you're working with managers from day one, they're bought in. They've helped design the study. If you go out and say, we want you to uh, supplementally, supplementally feed, you know, 20,000 bushels a day, a manager is going to say, that's ridiculous. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You're an idiot. And you're like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. What about 50? Oh, yeah, I can do that. So, you know, they help guide these ideas. And so once you test them, it goes back to the management loop. You've gotten rid of a limiting factor. Your quail population continues to get a little bit better. Field borders help the system. We heard that in a talk. Something helped the system. It's a little bit better. What's the next limiting factor? And that's the iterative process here. So, you know, Tall Timbers is located in the Red Hills. Greatest quail hunting in the world, as I just said. I know you might argue that, but I got to say it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun wherever you are. I've had some of my best quail hunts with that guy right over there, Dale Rollins, and uh, in the Rolling Plains, I got to say. Uh, it's been spectacular at times. But uh, um, management, long term monitoring, demographics, assessing limiter factors, research on the limiters, and revised management. Well, from the 70s to the late 80s, early 90s, tall timbers were still burning their property, but they weren't managing the property. They weren't doing co-production. They were just letting nature take its course. Limiting factors were building. The quail population dropped, as it did everywhere else in the southeast, to about a bird per 10 acres in the spring. 
Then we started getting serious about co-production find out the limiting factors, apply the management, increase. And now we've continually had over a bird to two birds per acre. These are spring densities here. So it does work. It worked on our little property and uh, it helped to change how things operate. So you can, you can manage or you can manage and incorporate science into your process. And this is really important for me to say real quick is that you don't have to radio tag birds to do this on your land. It's as simple as this. I might try supplemental feeding. Don't do it on the whole place. Pick two pastures and check it out for five years and see what happens. If your hunting success doesn't improve, either you have other limiting factors or it didn't work. It's okay. But you can, you can apply this in your management and you learn. And then you say, you know what? We, got, we did a little bit better. We'll try it this way. And of course, as you're doing it, you're using common sense and all these other factors come into play. The problem with theories is do they shed light or do they blind? And so Paul Arrington had a wonderful theory about predation and how only so many quail would over, survive over winter. And so it didn't matter how many you shot because only so many quail are going to survive over winter anyway. So that's why we have such liberal harvest regulations today. And also why people thought it doesn't matter if you hurt a predator because you got this like only fixed amount of quail that can survive on the landscape. So if you get rid of a predator, it's not going to matter long term. And, and I won't go into the details of it, but it is true. I mean, people bought into this for 20, 30, 40 years to where almost every single biologist in the country that studied quail believed it. It was completely correct. So how many people think sugar is worse for you than salt or salt's worse than sugar? Probably most people in here think salt's worse than sugar. Sugar is much more deadly than salt. But there's a reason that you think that. It, it, you think about that for a second. It, your choices of what you eat based on what you believe, the choices of what you manage based on what you believe. And, and theory can blind us. And so for the young scientists and biologists out there, theory is important. It is important. It helps, helps build ideas, but be careful not to let it blind you. Uh, and I'll just run through a quick example. The, um, the, uh, Do theories improve management? So reducing predator impacts to quail populations in our neck of the woods, and remember the context, our neck of the woods, through trapping and supplemental feeding would not, according to the theories, increase quail populations because we had 100% usable space, and you can't increase quality, it's usable space. Two, density dependency. So density dependency says, if you crank out more young in this breeding season, you're just gonna have higher overwinter mortality or you're gonna reach some threshold and quail aren't gonna increase. Or you're gonna release a bunch of re cotton rats, or you're gonna do something, it's just not gonna work, man, it's just not gonna work. And we heard that through the cows come home. <coughs> well, we started talking to the managers and they believed it was work. They've been out there managing their lands, they've been playing with stuff, they felt like quail populations were impacted by food resources. They felt that there were so many predators now that we don't have the panther, now that we don't have the red wolf, now that we're not trapping for fur. They felt like there's predators out there that were impacting their populations. Quail science believed it was unlikely to matter. There's great habitat, there's legumes everywhere, there's pine mast. And so, anyway, so we developed an understanding, I won't go into the details, we did a lot of iterative stuff and this over time, but we developed an understanding working with managers on how to measure the food resources, how to apply food resources, what made sense for them, how you deliver that to the system, and we tested it on populations. And the blue bars show fed area, the red bars on fed area, that's fall populations, effective supplemental feeding, and the other side is a shift, you see it's greater than zero, basically populations under, uh, and production under, uh, under predator management was greater. So, this is co-production in process. Properties started applying this stuff. This is horseshoe plantation in the Red Hills. Started doing a merchantable cut. That's the habitat side. I didn't get into that. Uh, Year-round supplemental feeding on merchantable hardwood cut. They stopped using food plots. They stopped disking brood fields. All these things they changed to where their populations have increased and they're sustaining six to 10 covey an hour hunting. This is the Albany Quail Project. You see where it started, co-production got them from around three to four coveys an hour to where They've been averaging close to 10 cubbies an hour ever since. And so these things 
have resulted in tremendously good quail hunting on these properties. And I don't want to really, I don't want you to focus on that. It's really the process. So it doesn't matter whether you're working on public lands, whether you're working on large landscapes like Kelly talked about, or whether you're working on individual properties, it's that process of getting rid of these limiting factors and you can do it too. So. 30 years of co-production, we've done a lot of stuff to help understand these things, whether it's timber management. We just did one on dog training. This is interesting. We had plantations that were concerned that spring dog training was going to impact their nesting of their hens or survival of their hens. So we went, met with the managers, found out how many times people train their dogs in the spring. We did, and this is important, we did low and we did average and then we did a really high one. You know, how far can you push the system? You know, let's learn. So we went out and we flushed birds with training bird dogs and flushed these radio tagged hens and looked at reproduction and survival. And there was no difference, which we didn't think there would be. But the point is that helps them understand how they can train on their property. So here's a relationship of timber density. Brad Kobeczka talked about that a minute ago and quail abundance. You know, just all this information through time provides us with um, evidence. And then we tie it to the demographic rates. If you can afford to do the demographic rates, that's fine. But you can see here where pre-thinning and post-thinning, you know, has a difference on survival. And we know that what we said earlier, that the one on the left, the pre-thinning, well, yeah, your left, the one on the pre-thinning, the pre that's a stable population, but it takes increasing those demographic rates. So you understand what your management is doing to your demographic rates, which helps you guide management, make it better. And better is just better. You know, and if you notice, none of this required a theory of usable space. It didn't require Arrington's theory of compensation. It didn't require any of that stuff. Um, it's just co-production. It's just it's just applying science to your management, and that's what's really driven everything. And it's not just in the Red Hills. This is spring cockbird counts across the southeastern United States on 60 properties. And there's Texas and um, Alabama and North Carolina. We got quail up in Maryland, Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Central Florida. And they're averaging, that's an average of nine cockbirds per point this past spring on sites that some of them have been managed a long time, some not. But you can see the colors are kind of mixed. It's not all just grouped up Albany Red Hills. So we're seeing this success on tens and tens of thousands of acres now utilizing this process. So I, I want to implore a couple things while I have your ear. One is that you all are at a stage of quail decline where there's a lot of mystery and, and we were there too. And what we've learned after testing genetics and looking at all kinds of things too is basics, good habitat, keeping your predators in check, providing food resources, whatever. It's, that's what's been driving quail populations. And it's important to remember that. And basics can be, because I've been to a lot of ranches out in this part of the world and, and South Texas, a handful. And when you go out and you see exotic grasses covering up the place, and I, I don't see quail habitat. You know, basics. Um, Co-production is an incredibly successful process, and I've seen some groups here that are doing it now. In fact, the uh, um, experiment that was ex just uh, that Ryan just showed us was a, a great example of co-production. Um, the work the East Foundation, I think it was, is doing is a great example of co-production. And so I'm real excited to see that. That's the value of the Rolling Plains Research Ranch sites. That's the value of these long-term research sites. They can do these co-production methods and then have more quail. That's what Brad Daubert's doing and others. So, you know, keep that in mind. I think it's really what's helped us get to where we are because we've started asking the hunters what they want. And it's about putting more birds on the ground. Tommy Hines told me a long time ago, the glory's in the cubby rise. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's not rocket science, but it's sound science. You can't, you know, I encourage you to start. It, it's, it's using great techniques. It's using good information. It's doing it right. It's applying the treatment on the ground in a way that you think you might get it. Start where you apply a treatment where you're going to think you're going to see a response. Don't put a... Don't feed too little or don't graze, you know, 
too much to not have a chance to even see a treatment. Start with a range of treatments and find out what that relationship is. That's how you drive management and learn. And then uh, it's long-term output focused and it's team effort, everyone involved, policymakers, landowners, managers, et cetera. And theories in the end are put to the test. In our area, as you saw that graph, I'm glad Brad showed that. I forgot to bring it. The, uh, all those points on tall timbers. You even saw points in the lake. Well, the lake goes dry every now and then. So <laughs> it wasn't, they weren't swimming. But uh, that's 100% usable space, folks. So we shouldn't have been able to adjust density by affecting food supplies. So, you know, you can test theories and do all this other stuff as you go along. So anyway, I'm real excited to be here. I appreciate the getting to hear everything going on here in Texas. And I'm proud Tall Timbers is in Texas in our little nook. And uh, we look forward to continue to work with everybody. And thank you very much. I enjoyed it. OK, Dale. They'll come and wrap us up. Thank y'all all so much for coming out. Thank you, Raymond. Hats off to Bill Palmer and Clay Sisson and the long history of uh, proving what's working down there. And then uh, for all the ones that you've heard this morning of basically taking many of those ideas and seeing if we can extrapolate those from a 50 inch rainfall zone to a 20 inch rainfall zone. So I first met Bill, I believe it was in 1998 at the Quell Unlimited Convention in Houston, Texas. And uh, I lament the decline of Quell Unlimited, especially for one reason, and that they had an annual convention. And that's where Bill and Clay and a number of us got together and got to compare notes every year. So I would propose and hope that this convention, uh, at least in Texas and, and the Southwest, can take the place of that because uh, those types of information, uh, opportunities for information exchange, I think are really important. I was holding a meeting in Sarah, Oklahoma one year. And the guy walked in, he was 88 years old, and the county agent said, well, I'm surprised to see you, Mr. So-and-so. And the gentleman stood up and said, education is a lifelong process. Can I have an amen? Amen. All right. Bill, we had Bill and Clay come out to Roby, Texas, in the community building there in 2008 for the inaugural session of the Distinguished Lectureship in Quail Management. Standing room only, had 120 people crammed in that little room. They spoke to us for about six hours and did an outstanding job. And again, uh, we commend him and the, and the efforts they're doing down there. Will Rogers once said that a conference is nothing but admission an admission that you want someone else to join you in your problems. And, and I think we started out, certainly this past two days, uh, with that being kind of a, an, uh, an undercurrent, if you will. And I've been to a lot of these. I missed the one in 90... Nine, I'm sorry, 2019, I missed the one, that one. I was in the hospital, and I really appreciate Amanda Gobelli and the time, and, and a lot of y'all sent me uh, congratulations, and, and I appreciated those uh, thoughts and prayers there. But I sense that this one, and maybe I'm just overly optimistic, but I sense that this one, a renewed interest and an excitement in collaboration and networking that I've seen over the last 48 hours. So I commend all of you for that. Going back to my oldies, you've heard of a song by a group named Buffalo Springfield? For what it's worth? Remember the opening lyrics? There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there telling me I got to be square. I know who that square guy was, Bill, and uh, again, we've had some great discussions over the years, and and uh, and, they, and I often, uh, as I think about, as I contemplate quail decline, at least in Texas, I tell landowners it's not a single shot. 
We all want to point to the pariah du jour, whether that be Bermuda grass, whether that be fire ants, whether that be Cooper's hawks, whatever your particular cause may be. I remind them that quail decline is a revolver. It's not a single shot. There are multiple cylinders operating simultaneously. And we've heard, uh, again, some good presentations this morning, uh, some excitement, I think, or at least I interpret it as that. And I'm reminded of George Patton when he said, if everybody's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. And so you see a diversity of thought. You see those types of new ideas that are being brought. I want to take a number of you back to the mid early 70s, the um, Earth Day movement. Iron Eyes Cody, remember that advertisement? Uh, when the tear rolled down his eye, some of you do. The mantra at that time was, think globally, but act locally. And Kelly Rayner and, and talks about brought to, to mind the large scale as several others, Abe Woodard and others did. But act locally. Involve your local people, involve your neighbors. Uh, try to get them motivated. Point number seven of Susie's 12 point plan says invest in the future. I'm excited at this particular symposium to see the number of young, especially Texas Parks and Wildlife biologists. And I'm going to ask all those individuals, if you work for Texas Parks and Wildlife, please stand, young or old. That's a good crowd, guys. Whoa, 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 stay standing, stay standing. Now then, if you own a pointing dog, stand, the rest of you sit down. <laughs> Therein lies an opportunity. <laughs> and I'm very proud of Barrett Kennecke and John McEachern because they got bird dogs and they matriculated up through the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. And I'm very proud to think that I might have had a little bit of something to do with it. They got bird dogs and quail hunters. And it's an opportunity for the rest of us. The future is here today, but we have to learn to see it. And we've got to learn to get those we we, we got to help to get those biologists especially motivated for quail. If they haven't been quail hunting and they don't have a pointing dog, it's going to be much more difficult. So my challenge to you as landowners, as students of quail, invite your local biologist out for a quail hunt. And as you have that litter of pups, John McEachern, Think about your colleagues. And again, we, I'd, love, I'd love to see every rancher in Texas have a bird dog. I'd love to see every Parks and Wildlife biologist have a pointing dog. I want to point out Kyle Hand. I don't know if he's been introduced. Kyle, where are you at? Stand up, please. Kyle is the uh, newly appointed statewide game bird specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Took John McLaughlin's place when John moved up. So uh, we really appreciate Kyle. Kyle was in our Quail Masters class a couple of years ago, and I got to know him a little bit. I want to plug the Quail Masters opportunity for all of you. Um, and then I'm going to begin to, I'm going to make, we're going to do the door prize and so forth after my concluding remarks. And it's 1147 right now. Your schedule says we are due to finish at 12. A successful meeting starts on time. It stays on time so it can end on time. And I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our moderators. I want to thank that buzzer when it works for helping us keep uh, keep on schedule. I want to thank Dana Wright. Dana. Dana is going to sleep much better tonight. <laughs> and those of you, and again, many of you know Dana, especially, uh, again, we were lucky to get her from Parks and Wildlife when she retired back in December. And uh, a tremendous young lady, and I've really enjoyed the opportunity. If you don't, haven't had a chance to visit with her and get to know her, do so because she's got a lot of energy, a lot of creativity, and her work ethic is incredible. Just don't call her between 11 a.m. and noon because she's watching her soap operas then. <laughs> we'll give you that, Dana. want to thank all of our sponsors, and man, 
were we blessed yeah. with the with a number of sponsors? I think from Dan and my standpoint, we were floored with the opportunity. Normally, you're having to really kind of scrape up and you hope you get some good sponsors. Look around. Look at the number of door prizes that we've had. Look at the silent auction item. We had tremendous buy-in from all of our sponsors, and we appreciate all of you. And I'm going to uh, bring my remarks to a close. Bear with me. I recited a little bit of that poetry yesterday, the ship of state. And again, the message behind the ship of state is although we face challenges, we have to be resolute. We have to be optimistic. We have to maintain that hope. As Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. We're kind of at that point, but we need some encouragement and some exhortation. So I'm going to read the last stanza. In spite of rock and tempest roar, in spite of false lights on the shore, sail on nor fear to breast the sea. Our hearts, our hopes are all with thee. Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our, tra our faith triumphant over years are all with thee, are all with thee. Keep the faith, ladies and gentlemen. We will plan on doing this again in 2025. And I hope we can build on the success that we've had with this one, the continued success. Our wish, good wishes uh, for all the good work that was being done today that was reported upon. And we look forward to updates on that. And we look forward to hearing good news from that. Dana, is there anything that I've overlooked? Dana, anything I've overlooked as far as last minute announcements? Okay. Recycle your name tags, please. And I think we're ready for the last round of door prizes. So if, if some of my young ladies from the research ranch could, could bring those up. And if we could bring the lights up, we'll go through with this last set of door prizes, including the shotgun and the big screen TV. And the door, okay, Ricky Lennox, Kent Mills, Haley Hawkins, Hunter Hopkins going to announce the results of the seed ID contest and the plant ID contest. If you want to be literate in quail management,